I guess Call the meeting to order. Um, 540, 532, 6. 6. Cliff really wants to start early. He wants to start earlier, Jerry. You said, no, I've been an hour late. I, I turned it back <laughs> two hours. I, so I don't know how to turn the clock back. <laughs> so I've been an hour early. I've been an hour uh, early. Yeah, hour early for everything. For everything. Uh, and the first item on our agenda is, as usual, uh, public input. Is there any public input? Anything that isn't on our agenda? No. All right. The second item is a student report, and we have Kate Pecora, class of 2017. Hi. Um, it's great to be here. This is my first meeting. I was elected last year, um, so I'm a senior at the high school. Um, I'm very excited. <laughs> um, the first part that I'd like to talk about today is the athletics of the high school, because obviously we've been um, had some major accomplishments in the past couple of weeks. Um, so starting off with football, football has had a winning streak over Danvers. Uh, they've continued that winning streak um, on Friday. The score was 13 to uh, 35 to 14. And they are going to play next Friday, November 11th at 7 o'clock versus Marblehead. And it, the game will be at Marblehead. Um, and then I just saw um, on Twitter that Matt McCarthy was nominated to the Boston Herald and Boston Globe as star of the week. So we're very proud of him. I know, you know, yes. yeah, he's definitely pulled the team. And it's a team effort, but Matt certainly has um, some, some great plays in all of the games. Um, on to girls soccer. The girls had a 2-0 victory in the quarterfinals versus Tewksbury yesterday. They will play tomorrow at 5 o'clock at the Manning Field in Lynn versus Swampskit, and that will be the semifinal game that will determine whether they make the finals. And then tonight, boys soccer is playing as we speak. I just heard that one to they, one. they are currently tied. <laughs> um, Ten minutes left. They are uh, playing Jer uh, Jeremiah Burke High School in South Boston and Cheer. Also, we host uh, North Reading hosted Cal's this past Thursday here at the high school for cheer. And uh, North Reading came in second despite uh, numerous injuries from the team, but they are they still won second, so they were pushing for the uh, pushing for finals. Um, on to fine arts and like performance performances that are coming up. Uh, the Oliver ticket dates have so tickets released today, and the dates have been released. They are December third, fourth. 9th and 10th you can actually see them down there if you want to go buy your tickets after um, dancing with the hornets is coming up this thursday at 6 30. it's the third annual um, event hosted by dance club and student athletes um, i actually have a really big like it's my sort of my club so it, um, i'm very proud of the club that we've been able to grow as much as we have um, and then uh, along with that, the Hornet Holiday Marketplace is this coming Saturday. I believe it begins at 10 and it ends sometime to 3. Yeah. Um, and so we do have um, high school artists that will be selling their crafts at, uh, as vendors in the event. And we also have performances done by, um, I believe, the high school's a cappella team. And we also have dance club that will be performing. Um, coming up in two weeks is Spirit Week. Um, to lead up to the Thanksgiving break in the big Thanksgiving game. Each class, the day before, the, di the upcoming days before Spirit Week, are hosting uh, some sort of tournament. So uh, we have dodgeball, soccer, and spike ball as of right now. So every day after school, if, you'd, if a student would like to participate in any of the, those events, um, they're held directly after school. Um, then we have academic matters. So the Reality Fair is a new addition uh, run by the Rotary Club that will be brought in next third or this coming Thursday to the high school. There's a lot going on this Thursday, um, but it is a focus on career and money man. It's a yeah a career and money management program that will simulate a day in the life of the career that the student would want to have. So it shows you like how to budget your money with the anticipated career, um, and you know how you can how you can make a living, how you, you know, what t sort of lifestyle you would have. Um, th that is just for juniors, um, you know, I, <laughs> and then. Seniors already know all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> Freshmen and sophomores don't I need wish. to worry about it. No. Seniors know all that <laughs> I stuff. I wish. 
Um, also on Thursday, the student, New North Reading Student Council is going to the New uh, Northeastern Massachusetts Student Council Association Conference this Thursday uh, in Drake it. I believe last year, North Reading hosted this um, student council event. So this year it's being held at Drake it. I'd say overwhelmingly the student council population is attending it. Um, it's always been really successful uh, and you know, growing leadership skills and working with other people from other schools. And speaking of leadership skills, the Student Leadership and Mentoring, or SLAM, has continued to help freshmen transition into high school. And a lot of the SLAM mentors have been receiving assistance from our contracted facilitators at core trainings. I know that they've worked a lot to sort of figure out engaging programs to get the freshmen really more involved in school and more involved in academics, but make the transition more smooth than you know what, we, what it would be without the SLAM program. There are two power block programs that go on dirt m monthly, more or less. Um, the first is lunch with a scientist, so this definitely happens every month. Um, and a scientist comes in, comes in here to the DLL, and they talk about their their work as a scientist. A lot of students come and they can ask questions. Um, a survey is sent out about you know what did you learn, all of that sort of stuff. And similarly, Miss um, Bolinasi, the new guidance counselor, has started a career speakers spe career speakers series, and um, so she's been having people in like Mr. Bernard has come. I believe we've had police officers, lawyers, doctors, so all different careers that you can learn about um, and ask questions. And it's a very like intimate sort of setting in the library. Uh, for testing, the SATs were held this past weekend. I know that this was really the end of what most seniors had to take. So in December, it more switches over to um, to, jun to incoming juniors and um, seniors are pretty much wrapped up because many of them have met their November 1st deadline. Um, and if they have not for applying to colleges and um, they'll likely hear back by mid-December if they did not apply early yet, the um, deadline is mid to early January. So um, a lot of college programs coming up and a lot of um, work done on behalf of guidance that we're very um, proud of. And then for my student work report, I um, so I take AP Psychology, which in my opinion is what is, I take five AP classes um, and AP Psychology is like, by far the hardest AP that I've ever taken. Um, it's it's rigorous in that you really need to understand the material at an AP level. So uh, the past unit, what we were doing, um, we learned about sensation and perception. And um, our project was to create a 20 minute presentation um, about one of the five senses. So the um, one that I, my group was assigned to was uh, taste. So we did a, PowerPoint presentation on taste. And so we basically had to go up and speak for 20 minutes, which is a lot like, it's a long time when you've never done it before. Um, so our group really learned a lot. We had to present it to the entire class and that was really, um, you know, that became your knowledge for the test. So there was no really class instruction about each of these. What you learned about vision was what went on the test. Um, and I also have the rubric for that. So, um, Yes, yeah, so it was a 20 minute presentation and there was a lot of AP expectations that were sort of met, including critical thinking, time management. We only had two classes to do it, so you really had to be focused and be on task the entire time. And then class discussion. So there was um, sort of an interactive part of this. We had to also create an experiment um, to prove some of the theories in our presentation. So. Uh, for example, for taste, what we did is we had somebody smelling an apple and tasting, or smelling a pear and tasting an apple. And when they reported what they tasted, they said that they tasted the apple. Even the, they were, the yeah, tasted, tasted the pear. So, um, so they, you know, you, the fact that, of sensory interaction and how that plays a role into what you, your brain thinks you're actually tasting. And then for our second experiment, we took um, two cups of uh, like Gatorade almost and we said one of these is store brand and one of these is name brand. We want to see if you can tell the difference. And so we had a group of students take each of them and they, we knew that they were exactly the same. 
but we t- when t- by telling them that they were different, they were in- they anticipated it to be different, and they reported it as different to prove that um, when you expect something to happen, right. you're more likely to expect the results. Um, so we actually received a 96 on the project, which was one of the higher grades in the class. Um, it was definitely a grade booster. But it was a very rigorous project, and we put in a lot of hard work. Um, and I'm very proud of the outcome. Well, that was an That's excellent good. report. Yes, yes. very nice. Very, very good. So, is there yes. something? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Is there something that we can put under our children's nose so that when they eat their broccoli right? or whatever? <laughs> no. So actually, what we learned that they think they're eating candy. What we learned is that children actually um, their taste buds aren't adapt to all of these sorts of foods yet because you're actually not um, you're not supposed to eat bitter foods it's supposed to like signal poison oh. so that's why kids don't like um, don't like things like broccoli Interesting. Wow. the more you know <laughs> oh, sorry about that. a couple things sadly the boys lost two to one um, oh. they had a great season this was the number one seed um, they won their five games in a row they won four in a row to get into the state so um, <clears throat> great job by coach biz and the boys uh, the second thing I wanted to mention, you mentioned the football game, and, and I spoke with um, Mr. LaPrette today because I was wondering if they were going to have a fan bus, and he says they're hoping to have one if they if they get enough interest from students. So come on, students, get on that fan bus. Maybe oh, yeah. we get enough they, kids for two fan buses. They just sent an email, and every, I'm sure that they'll, I think they'll fill it up. I'm sure up. that they'll yes. be enough. Yeah. Yeah. This team, I want to congratulate Coach Wall, all of his assistant coaches, and all the players yes. because uh, in all of our fall sports teams, I mean the boys and girls soccer right. teams, but – the football team, if they win this game on Friday against Marblehead, they will go to the Super Bowl. You go to the Super Bowl. The first That's time right. In Thirty-six years. That's right. Yeah. So it's pretty exciting, and, and they put in a ton of work. You know, driving in tonight, they're down there under the lights practicing. Um, so it, it, it would be great to see a, a big uh, crowd from North Reading. And the game Friday night was, uh, you know, I am I am so um, on edge about the upcoming something happening tomorrow. I'm so on edge about it that I needed something to relax me in the football game well, Friday night. That something's going on tomorrow. Nothing and um, that game took my mind off the thing going on tomorrow for a couple of hours. And we just, we actually dominated Danvers. We manhandled them in the second half. It was, it was just outstanding. A great crowd. Great crowd. Um, it was just great. It was a lot of fun, and I'll definitely be a Marblehead Friday night. So and the girls' soccer team is on the right. watch again, so yep. just like last year, they had a great game last night. Yep, great game last so. night. So, um, but the football team deserves all our support because they yeah. these kids they work. have worked so hard, and it's been a long, long time since we've gotten this far. So it's going to be a big challenge because Marblehead's undefeated, but and they're the number one seed. Number one seed, yeah, and we're the number two seed, so it should be great. Well, for the first time in a long time, I was not at the football Yeah, I was looking for Friday you. Friday night. I happened to have a need to be in Maine, and I got blow-by-blow blow account <laughs> over the cell phone <laughs> messaging and uh, on, on edge the whole way through. And uh, since uh, Coach Wall happens to be a relative, uh, so a you special. Were in, you were in Maine. And you were in Maine, yeah. It was, it was my I, anniversary, my wife's birthday, and I was at the game. <laughs> one of those things, you know, one of those things. I, unfortunate. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank yes, you. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. That was very, good, was very Kate. good, Kate. Nice job. All right, next on our agenda is uh, continued business, the MSBA SSBC update. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of things to, um, to follow up on. Um, the discussions are ongoing for um, the, I've mentioned this to, to folks before um, regarding the drainage system. Um, we did have a meeting last week of which um, a number of people attended, including uh, public safety personnel, the DPW director, the town engineer, school personnel, um, and a, a follow-up meeting is scheduled for uh, this Wednesday morning at 1030 at my office to, uh, to continue the discussion um, around um, the plan to to address the repairs that are needed to the drainage system. So, not not a, not an awful lot that's conclusive to report tonight, but just to let folks know that the conversations are continuing. And um, I think we're we're kind of running up against the calendar a little bit with um, the weather and such for the winter approaching. But um, Wednesday should, I think, prove to either you know come to some sort of an agreement on whether or not we're going to pursue this um, in the fall, or we're going to wait until um, a later time when the weather improves. At the time that I wrote the report for you, um, 
I had indicated about the recommissioning of the boilers and the hot water system was scheduled to take place on Friday. It did, in fact, take place on Friday. There were a number of people here um, from all of the different, um, I'll say, the contracting groups from uh, engineers to installers to a state assigned commissioner. Um, we had a couple of members from the SSBC, the Secondary School Building Committee, with some expertise in the area that um, they were here. Project manager was on site, Wayne Heidecker, myself. And I would say to you that I would, I would capture the conversation as being productive. I think some things were, um, that were unearthed that are going to prove to be helpful to us in um, continuing to manage a very complex HVAC system. But um, there is more to come. I think the, the, the most important outcome, I think, was while there were some temporary solutions provided to us on Friday to help us in the short term, um, the engineer really needs to be involved as Vander Weil. And so the commissioning was going to follow up from Friday with um, trying to get more, I'll say, more permanent and long-term solutions to that. Um, again, as I wrote the report for Friday, um, unbeknownst to me that Mon was going to be back to hydro seed. So that was a good, uh, that was a good um, first step in, in continuing with um, addressing some of the landscape needs, but I do not have any further information on um, the replacement of um, some of the trees and shrubs um, that have died and need to be replaced. No further information on that. There was a meeting held today um, regarding the punch list. So there's, there is a monetized punch list available. Um, project manager PMA was um, on site at uh, the Doran Whittier office in uh, Newburyport this morning. Um, it's just it's too soon for me to have any details as to uh, how, what the outcomes from that meeting were. But I would expect it. We'll have more information at our next SSBC meeting on November 15th. They hydroseeded? They yeah. hydroseeded on yeah. Friday. No November is the best time of year to hydroseed. Actually, though, that's the reason like the why I germinated. Mr. Mr. Chair, yes. I, I want to continue to express my complete dissatisfaction with the foot dragging that's going on on the completion of this project. I find it unacceptable. Um, I find hydro seeding in November to be unacceptable. If that grass grows, it'll be uh, probably one of the seven greatest miracles the world has ever seen. Um, they were supposed to replace the trees in September. That's never happened. Um, this, this drainage thing, we knew about at the end of August, and here we are in November just getting a plan from them a week or so ago or two weeks ago. Um, I know that we want to end this on a happy note, but I continue to be completely dissatisfied with the performance of the main contractor on this project. That's all. You say that the grass is liable to not germinate yeah, in I November? Think, right. Actually, it's quite a bit germinating. I mean, it's, but it's, it's going to be below of, freezing for like yeah. the rest of the week yeah. at night. So I kind of. And to slow the yeah. germination down. Now, on the other hand, the thing we'll talk about later looks very good, the sod, but we can talk about that later. Maybe it'll warm up in December. <clears throat> Wash my mouth up. Next item on our agenda is new business. And the first item there is a school trip North Reading High School model United Nations. And we have a presentation on that, I believe. <coughs> Take a microphone. Oh, yeah, bring a mic. Yeah, that's for the cable. Um, so my name is Soterio Spinsopoulos. I'm a teacher at North Reading High School. I'm the advisor to the model United Nations. I'm Caleb Pelmas. I'm the treasurer for model United Nations. And uh, we came here today before you to um, uh, seek approval for a school trip that would be in late January. Uh, it's an overnight trip to the Harvard Model United Nations Conference. Uh, this would be, I believe, the uh, fourth year in a row that we've gone, fifth year overall, to the conference. It's an overnight Thursday, January 26th through Sunday, January 29th, uh, where students go in and act as members of the United Nations for a specific designated country. Uh, this year we were selected to represent Denmark and we have 20 interested students who would be um, taking part in different committees. Uh, I have a handout for you. I'll pass that out instead of reading through them. Um, and I brought Caleb here to kind of discuss why he wants to go and what his experience was like last year. And then I'm here to field any questions about the details of the trip. Uh, so this will be my second year going to the Harvard Model United Nations Conference. Last year, uh, we represented Belgium, and we had, I think, the most successful year we've had 
So far, we managed to win an award in the European Union Committee. Uh, this year, we're representing Denmark. We've got a lot of high attendance. Uh, we have, I've actually been selected this year for a special committee based on application where we're representing the cabinet and senior advisors of President Nixon in 1970, and I'll be serving as Henry Kissinger, the national security advisor. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, Much better looking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty big role. I was, yeah. I was, That's I was great. glad that he got on there, but to yeah. hear that he was Henry Kissinger was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. <laughs> And uh, this trip is a great time. It gives us a great experience and like applying the things that we practice in here every few weeks in our small meetings. We also have a competition against North Andover to prep us for this. And it's a great opportunity to get some speaking experience, get some experience in the real uh, process and procedures of the United Nations. Uh, we write draft resolutions, debate topics, all this uh, real world applications of uh, what we practice and study through our club meetings. And this is just a great experience all around. I had a phenomenal time last year and I'm excited to be going back again. Any questions? So, so people have already been assigned for these various yeah, the, uh, the application process actually is very far in advance. We have to apply at the end of the previous year. So we apply in the spring, and then we kind of get our assignments, we get our committee roles, and then we usually come before the board here either in October or November. Uh, the background guides, which is you know, anywhere from 50 to 80 page documents for the students to prepare, those are passed out in late uh, November and then they have all of December and January to prepare. And they even have to write position papers before attending. Now, how, how do you make the assignments? Uh, the assignments, I have them select. The, those are the committees that we've been assigned. Yeah. And then the students uh, write their preference, one through 12. And I try to get everyone in their top three. And I was able to do that for everyone except no one wanted the Historical Security Council for whatever reason. <laughs> um, probably because they just saw historical and <laughs> so. didn't have a year or anything. So, because the background guides aren't out yet, so we don't necessarily know the details of it, yeah. so. I thought Secretary Kissinger would make the appointments. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you, you don't have that power yet, huh? No, not quite. <laughs> how, many, how many schools uh, participate, do you know? Uh, it depends, uh, I actually have, I only have one copy of this, but this is the, uh, um, brochure from last year, the 2016, and it designates all the states and countries that are represented. So if I just flip to that page, we'll see, I'm counting three, six, nine, there's about probably half of the states, 25 of the 50 states, and Australia, Bahamas, Bangladesh, Brazil, wow. these are schools from there, wow. not representing those countries. That sounds great. Canada, China, Colombia. Mm. Costa Rica, I mean, all over the world. Uh, there are upwards of 2,000 students, I believe, participating. And it's run completely by the Harvard undergraduate students. Do students who participate in this get any academic credit for here? No. There's never been any academic credit. I, I have a lot of my students and my classes who take part, and they always ask for extra credit, but there's no academic credit. Okay. For it. It's uh, extracurricular, like uh, other any other right, club, uh, right. mock trial or anything. So, so like this that. is a lot of work on their own time. Of course, that, yeah. yeah. It's com it completely by their decision. Our club has about, I'd say, forty to forty-five students. We meet in here every other week and do mock debates. And about twenty-five, twenty-six were interested in going. So I actually had to make cuts. I had yeah. to choose twenty wow, based yeah. on how they were doing in our practices. And that's the first time I've had to do that. That's great. So it's clearly the club has grown over the years. Yeah, that's fantastic. <clears throat> so it's enrichment. Yes. Of course. <clears throat> Anybody else? I just think it's a wonderful program and I'm very, very glad that North Reading participates in it. My daughter had done it when she was in high school and she just got immense amount of um, experience from it and it helped her tremendously going into college too. I have a motion. The motion to Approve. accept North Reading High School model UN school trip. Sec Second. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to fight, but any further discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good luck. Your name. Good luck, guys. Your last name. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nice job. Please do not start a war. Yeah. Denmark's kind of safe. Denmark's pretty sure. Yeah, they're kind of safe. <laughs> Even a mark. Yeah, we're Denmark, so I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Uh, we're probably safe. Yeah. We actually, one student that is participating, Nicole Sullivan, she'll go, she's going on the uh, Scandinavia trip, too. I was talking to Mr. Nosey oh. about it. Oh. I was curious if there was any overlap. Only one of the 20 are it's going on that trip. Because so, he's the other advisor. He'll be there at the trip. So. Oh, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, the next item on our uh, agenda is a school trip for North Reading High School hockey team. Uh, looking for permission to participate in an invitational tournament sandwich on February 20th and 21st. Do we have any presentation on that? So, uh, there's no presentation, Mr. Chairman. It's just, this is a kind of a tradition um, for our hockey team. We've participated in an invitational tournament for 99. What, I was going to say as long as I've been here. So 99, Jerry. Okay. Yep. So, and uh, without incident, um, you know, I, I, I certainly endorse the trip. I know the high school principal does as well. It's one one overnight uh, on on the 20th of February. It's actually better now because they used to go over to Martha's Vineyard. Yep. This is easier. They can drive. They don't have to. It was a great easier. trip. Though. Yeah, Martha's it was. Vineyard was a great trip. This is much easier yeah. than yes, Martha's Vineyard. Yes, this is easier. Is so. Um, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve uh, the North Reading High School hockey overnight trip for the tournament in Sandwich, Massachusetts. Is it Sandwich? Yes, Sandwich. In February. A second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Uh, next item on our agenda is uh, North Reading High School Cooperative Ski Team. <clears throat> yeah. So um, this has been run by the uh, Athletic Subcommittee. We've been discussing this for a couple of months, I think it's fair to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Johnson has been working with uh, the Athletic Director at Haverhill High School, which will be the host for this team. And he has told us that there has been an expression of interest from maybe a half dozen people, could be more Might once more it that. becomes official. Yeah. Um, the students will pay fees based on our athletic fee policy. And hey, as I said, Haver will be the host team. Is there another, there's another school? Bill Ricca. Bill Ricca High School. Bill Ricca High School will also be involved. This will not involve going to Haverhill High School. The kids will um, go to the Bradford, Bradford area right, yeah. for their for their meets, and, and they, they, what they're going to do is they're going to pay the regular user fee, whether it's first sport, second sport, whatever it is. Right. And then basically we pay uh, Haverhill for the uh, right for the, the cost of the program. The cost of the program, exactly. If it's above, and we don't know how much. No, fee no, we pay. No. no, the students will pay the fee. The students right. pay yeah. the fee. The family but, cap will kick in, but not the. Oh, first I thought they were paying cap. the. Uh, no, they'll pay the. Sport. If they'll pay the fee. As if it was. As if whatever that fee okay. is, if right. it exceeds, right. but, it, the, but the family cap will not be exceeded. Right. All right. So, and then they, they, they will participate in the North Shore Ski League. Um, and then we've got, uh, we got some information from the Haverhill High School Athletic Department, Athletic Director Thomas O'Brien. And uh, <coughs> it seems reasonable. Um, and I think it's, you know, if we can offer extra opportunities for our student athletes without costing us a lot of money and mm -hmm. I think I think we should I, I'd recommend we move forward I think the athletic this. subcommittee recommended yes uh, the athletic subcommittee recommends recommended it. moving forward with this Julie just a question on transportation how does transportation work well, their, we own transportation. their own their own their own their own transportation yeah it's the same thing with uh, girls who participate in gymnastics, gymnastics. or uh, hockey. girls hockey, hockey or wrestling mm -hmm. right okay. they have to get over to Linfield on their own or to the gymnastics. Same as when we were renting tennis space. Right. I mean, they had to go and provide their own transportation right. for practices and things like that. So. Yeah. And you said that there's six <coughs> people at North Reading that Well, he said there was a handful them? of people that yeah. have expressed interest right. but just in the early stages. They may get more. I know that when they were running the ski club oh, at, at the, the middle, middle school. school, they used to have bus Tons of yeah. Yeah. kids mm. going. So. Uh, it's worth a try. Everything we've tried has kind of caught on. The gymnastics, the right. wrestling, the uh, the girls' ice hockey. hockey. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to 
approve North Reading High School's participation in a cooperative ski team with Haverhill High School as the host program and with Bill Ricca High School as the other um, school participating. Second. Okay, made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. And I, I should note that um, the co-op programs, they run two years, correct? Correct. Every, every two years we have to resubmit yes, to the MIA. Yes, I believe that's in the notes here, yeah. So. All right, the next item on our agenda is a uh, technology survey. Uh, Dr. Downs has something to say. Hi, can you hear me? Um, yep. So last spring, um, I attended at the Department of Education with about 22 other districts, an introduction to the MassTracks.net software. And with this software, we were able to conduct an inventory of the devices that we had in district. Um, and with this inventory of devices, what this software does is it also produces a technology readiness survey um, that kind of compares our school by school comparison with the devices and, uh, and gives us kind of a readiness for CBT testing and computer based testing. Um, as one of the pilots of this district, it was a good opportunity to kind of do this inventory, um, get used to this software. It's something that the state has purchased and wanted some districts to pilot. Um, the other half of this, this piece of software includes um, some devices, uh, some online surveys to survey parents, students, staff about how and administrators as well about how technology is used in the district, how students are using digital learning tools. Um, and what it does is it actually uh, does a little bit of a gap analysis for us and how we're up using the tools, how students are working with the tools, how they're working with it, uh, working with the tools at home, um, a variety of different types of questions to kind of give us a really strong handle on how digital learning is happening at home as well as at school and, and gives us a readiness kind of um, for these areas. So we can kind of start looking at um, what, how the things that we're doing really well and the things maybe we need to work on. So I was hoping to use this survey as a starting point for the redevelopment of the new tech plan um, so that when we sat down um, in about a month or so um, and started going over some of the things we were looking at for the future of technology in the district that we'd have some kind of action items that could come from this survey. Um, for the students, I would anticipate only doing the fifth grade and have it, you know, have some help. I know some of the language on the survey might be difficult for some of them. Um, you know, some guidance and assistance with that survey, um, you know, just to kind of get, you know, get, move, move through it. Um, the fifth grade, they do recommend possibly fourth grade, but I really feel like with the fifth grade being in the elementary, what we're doing in the elementary on the fifth grade would pretty much encapsulate what's happening in the elementaries. Um, Middle school students, we could administer through the technology classes where they see about 80% of the students as it is. Um, in the high school, through some of the department classes that have the computers um, during one of their blocks and um, possibly sending a uh, survey out to parents um, and another survey out to administrators. Um, so it's my hopes with uh, the use of this survey and having it open you know, anywhere from about two weeks to three weeks um, to get uh, an accurate kind of description of what's happening on all these different levels with the use of technology. Um, it'd be a great place to start, you know, for developing some action items that we could look at to um, put as part of our five-year plan. Any discussion? I, I read through this. I don't see anything in here that would be, you know, bothersome to me. But it, it, will there be an opt-out if? Students don't want to participate. They don't. They don't. It's not a required. Not a mandate that they participate. Yeah, that'd be that'd be fine. The nice thing about this survey is that it does um, have a minimum. So um, there's a. I think there's a a minimum per each level of response that we need. And if we don't get that minimum, it actually doesn't report the data and doesn't go into our report. So with any level that do, we don't get a report, it doesn't impact our results. So um, we're able to kind of, you know, really look at the areas succinctly and clearly. And, um, you know, if it, you know, if we ask another class just to get that kind of minimum, it, it would be completely fine. Julie? Have um, any of our digital learning 
teachers or classroom teachers weighed in on any of these items? No. Is there a chance for them to look at this prior to prior to ad students? administering it to the students? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, what I would anticipate is I would share this out with the digital learning specialist prior to them administering it to the students and then give them suggestions for modifying some of the questions for them to be able to understand them and properly answer them. You know, and I would expect the digital learning specialist who with the classroom teacher while administering it, that they kind of walk the students slowly through it so that they kind of understand everything clearly and, and they would have seen it before, prior to administering it. It wouldn't be done cold. When do you um, think of doing this? Um, if you said it, I, I apologize. Yeah, you know, really as soon as possible. I'd, I'd really like to get, um, you know, as soon as next week, put it out and leave it out for, you know, probably about three weeks to try to get as much response as possible, administering it, but not, you know, I don't, it really is it, once we get a proper amount of response will be pretty good i mean i think i think that the big part will be getting um you know the parent response sometimes you know i mean i think we have strategies for getting the student response and people will be very willing it's just getting accurate amount of parents so that we can get the the data that we need so the parent survey would be a little different it would be different right because these yep the exactly. one thing i like about this and i know that's not the main reason for doing this but it could give us some input too into um, problems, uh, technology-related problems that students see in the school. I, I'd be interested in, you know, in us seeing that kind of feedback, misuse of technology, you know, wasting time with technology, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that that's a good, I know it's only one small part of this, but that's a good line of questioning that will help us as a district and also help you and, and your staff to see what's, what's happening and how, how kids are using the technology. And it produces a report. It's not really, it doesn't produce just solely results that we look at, you know, 20% said this or 14% said that. It actually produces a report that we can concretely use as part of our um, participation as also as a future ready district. Uh, we'll be a lot, this, this MassTracks.net um, software, their, their questions and focus areas are based around the same tenets of the future ready um, school school report so this will align with us you know as we look to you know we're attending the summer and the future ready summit on november 14th to 15th i hope to you know after that summit and 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 look how we can plan as a district to align ourselves to future ready then use the results of the survey to kind of you know review what's actually happening in the district so we can kind of do a firm gap analysis and find some focus areas and see what you know what we're doing right and what we might need to work on Sounds good to me. Any further? No. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. So do we need, do to, we need to vote on that? Motion. Need to vote on that? Yeah. Oh, need a vote. Yeah. Or survey, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Please. Yes, we thank do. You. We need a vote. <laughs> All right, is there a motion? Well, How would you say a motion to allow a technology survey? Yeah. Um, uh, five through 12? and parents and educators too. Thank you. Um, to gather information to be used to inform the development of the school district technology plan. Second. Made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thanks, Dan. Next item on our agenda is the uh, spring 2016 state standardized test results. Oops, killed you there. wanted to bring you through uh, some information about our standardized test scores. Um, I start off with just the background here, the commissioner's decision, just to refresh everyone's memory from last fall, 
Um, next year we are going, and next spring in 17, we're going with a next generation MCAS, also um, called MCAS 2.0. Formal name is next generation MCAS. MCAS 2.0 is also um, used sort of as a nickname. Um, this was awarded to Measured Progress, who was the former um, provider of the testing, and there's a subcontractor with Pearson. Um, there's a commitment to computer-based state assessments with the goal of implementing this statewide by spring of 2019. We will be testing on grades four and eight through computer-based testing in spring of 2017. That was the minimum uh, grades where we could um, implement testing this year, and we've decided to go with the minimum, and our plan is to always sort of go with the minimum each year that we go with that um, as we prepare our devices and our infrastructure for readiness. So again, we're in a good place. We've been since all of the testing infrastructure, all of the, all of the um, interfaces that we have to use both on the back end and on the front end are exactly the same as we've been familiar with since we've been um, piloting PARC for two years. We didn't use uh, computer-based testing last year, but we stayed very closely, Dan and his team, uh, very closely monitored any changes in the, in the system. And so we're, we're in a very good place for that, but there's a lot of questions and, and work to be done around our device and infrastructure readiness as well. Um, but we should be in good shape for grades four and eight this year. So I will talk about that a little more at the end. Um, just to put this uh, state standardized testing in, in a framework of other standardized tests and assessments that we have in this district, um, we've been using iReady Math now for several years in grades K to five. Um, last year, because the middle school teachers were so, um, and administration were so enthusiastic about what they were receiving in terms of um, information about students that were standardized across the three schools. And quite honestly, in, in a time where the, the, the state standardized test is in constant flux each year, it's, it's been very helpful to have um, this test. The other thing about iReady um, is that it's an adaptive test, so whereas the state assessment shows you exactly where students are against the standards, this test shows you exactly where students are. So students get questions based on their um, actual grade level um, knowledge of, of the content standards. It's very helpful information. So we've been doing that in math for several years, K to five, we've added K to eight. This year, um, the teachers wanted to use the iReady reading assessment, and we ended up doing that in grades three to eight. So we had another subgroup that investigated that. Um, high school's also using it in part as well. They really wanted to replace the test that we'd been using for many years for reading readiness um, in those grade levels that was a paper-based assessment. So the, the computer-based assessment offers many, many um, advantages, and uh, the teachers are very interested in that. So this is the first time that we've been able to offer that in grades uh, three to eight, um, and also for select students at the high school. So grades three to eight, every student is taking that assessment. In high school, it's a select group of students for reading remediation. Um, we still are implementing the Dibbles assessment and the DRA at the elementary schools for those early grades for literacy readiness. Um, there are common assessments for student growth. This is a best practice of, of education. It's an integral part of our eval system. So disciplines are developing common assessments, and that's the way we can ensure that students are able to demonstrate what they know and are able to do um, consistently across grade levels. So there's always concerns about just you know this idea of over testing and too much assessment. Um, we're very aware of that. We have conversations with our curriculum leaders all the time. As recently as um, just last week, I was talking with our elementary teachers about our writing prompts and, and really trying to keep in mind that now that we're doing a lot of assessment and getting a lot of data at the beginning of the year, we also need time just for teaching. We can't always be assessing. So that's something we're very much aware of um, within this best practice of having these common assessments is not oversaturating as well. Always, uh, we've got our mid-year and final exams as well as you know, SATs and AP practice opportunities for students. So I just wanted to set that stage with, um, with some of the standardized assessments as well. So for last spring, the results we're about to look at, we did grades three to eight. We used the PARC assessment. Um, there was on paper, and there were no state results released this year because there was, the sample sizes were such with paper, with computer, and with students doing MCAS that they did not release statewide results. Um, we tested in English language arts and literacy, ELA, and mathematics. And 72% of the state took PARC to prepare for this next generation MCAS. Grade 10 also took MCAS. There are state results available in ELA and mathematics. Our fifth, eighth grade science and technology engineering MCAS, STE. There are some state results available there. Biology and science for high school, MCAS. We also took the alternative assessment, which is called the MCAS-ALT, 
and our access for EL students, English language, uh, English learner students, we took that as well. We don't see a lot of results for that published because our number is, is below the minimum number uh, to report out. So what have we done this year? Um, we have our data that's available in a program called Edwin Analytics. We've spent a lot of time, our administrators, since um, the last several months since it's been available, looking at this in our Dropbox on Edwin. Um, we've, we have very limited access to a lot of the item level analyses that we've been accustomed to. Um, you have 10 years, 15 years of MCAS questions that are able to give us, when you click on a question, you are able to um, see the actual item and really analyze which uh, question students did well on. That level of item level analysis has not been present so far with, with, this, with the park assessment. Um, they have promised us many times that with MCAS 2.0, we will be returning to some of that level of analysis. Um, so we, that's something we're constantly, all of us in the state are pushing uh, to have more of that because it's very helpful to see the actual test questions released. So we've been working with our principals, our curriculum leaders, and our data leaders at each building. Something uh, it's a little bit different this year, John and I have actually visited and had uh, very beneficial meetings with all of the principals um, with, with a series of questions that were asked across all the schools. And we had some, we've had some very good discussions about um, you know, what's working well, what needs some improvement at each school. And we found that to be very, uh, very beneficial this year. So the park data, if you recall, is a little bit different than MCAS. There are five levels. This is probably something that we won't see after this year, but there are five levels. They are exceed expectations, meet expectations, approached expectations, partially met, and did not yet meet. So we're going to focus on this uh, chart. I've highlighted the areas of four and five. That's really the students that have met and exceeded their expectations for PARC. So I've broken these out. I'll, I'm just going to go um, through all the different grade levels um, for this overview. But at grade three, I've highlighted ELA and mathematics. You can see that there are. Um, 79% level four and five for ELA, 85% for mathematics. So Patrick, yeah, so yes. we have no state data to compare these against, correct? We do not. What about other district data? So you can compare other district by district, but even the DART analysis tool is not quite set up this year for this uh, type of analysis. So they've, they've really instructed us to look at ourselves and to look at ourselves against ourselves from last year. I think that's good, but I think the inability to compare to other districts is, is kind of crazy, uh, yeah. or to, to a statewide average. Uh, I mean, yes. you know, we should be well above the statewide average, and then we have kind of our peer districts that we like to look at and say, mm -hmm. you know, how, how are we doing? Absolutely. No. I don't disagree. This is a one-year problem. Um, okay. th this will, all of that will return, obviously, with only one year of data. Um, but next year with MCAS, this was just based upon several different things, but they've, they've claimed that it's based upon um, the, the set sizes. I think it also has to do with the, the, the I'm sorry, the variable of computer versus paper, um, which will go away after this year. So I think they just didn't um, process that this year. So one other question. I, I know you can't do apples to apples with MCAS results, mm -hmm. but MCAS had what, four, four levels, correct? Yep. So. Do four and five equal what three and four would have equaled in MCAS? Or is that a higher performance, four and five, than MCAS three and four? It's, is, or is there, any way, to, is there any way to compare it? Yeah, it's slightly different. It's a little bit more complicated because there's, a, there's different cut scores in different places. But, it, but essentially, that's what I'm trying to do here is show you advanced and proficient okay. in its own terms. Um, but it's a little bit different because the cuts are a little different. Because in this level three almost sounds like proficient. Yeah, because it's yeah, it's a little bit higher standard, but you're going to see a new system come out with new cut scores and new, you know, but I, you know, I, I feel like in, in our district focusing on level four and five was really mm -hmm. where we want to be. But I but I agree. We we have, you know, very few level ones and twos. That's another way I could have presented the data. I mean, we have very few students at that end of the spectrum. So uh, grade four, 80 percent ELA, 69 percent in mathematics. <clears throat> grade five is 84% for ELA, 70% for mathematics. Grade six was 79% and 75%. Grade seven was 67% for ELA and 71% for mathematics. Grade eight was 70% for ELA, 62% for mathematics. Um, the numbers are lower there in, in the number of students because our Algebra one students, we had 100% of the students who took that course um, achieved 100% wow. level four and five. So 
I think that's a testament to the students, obviously, um, the teachers, and also everyone involved in um, making sure that the right students were in that course. I mean, this, if you remember, we talked a lot about that being a high school level assessment. Um, this will not be offered again this year, though. That was something that was a park. So MCAS at grade 10, ELA and mathematics, also grade five, SDE, grade eight, eight SDE, and then high school biology. I'm gonna share the scores here from high school. 97% um, of the students advanced or proficient in ELA. 89% advanced or proficient from mathematics. For STE in grades five, eight, and biology, 75% um, proficient or advanced in grade five, 40% in grade eight, and 88% um, in biology. And I will say that you know um, the state averages for the middle school assessment are are about that that place. So just. I know that looks very, very low compared yeah, to the other eight, two. That grade eight science has been a problem since they instituted the test. Yeah. It's, it's almost year, like so they're giving a test that the kids aren't being taught the, uh, the subject matter because it's been low since we introduced that MCAS eighth yeah. grade science test. It's across the board. And it's, um, I will speak in a couple of slides later too. There's a whole transition with, with science and there's a, lot, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes already on this, but we're also transitioning to new standards and new assessments um, in the near future. So this is the accountability part of the discussion. Um, that's just, this is just an overview of a few of the, uh, what the reports look like for accountability. So again, we are a level two as a district. Um, we have a few schools in the district that are level two and the district can only be as high as the, the, the highest level of its lowest um, achieving school. I think it's important to remember that there are five accountability and assistance levels and we are in level one and two, which is the green area. As the graphic goes down to yellow and red, there's an increase in the amount of assistance from the Department of Education. Um, so the lowest 20% of the schools in the Commonwealth receive the most assistance and support from the Department of Ed. The upper 80% are in the green area. That's where you want to be is in the green. Uh, what we focus on for determining this are looking at all students and then looking at the high needs group. So special education, English learners, and economically disadvantaged. So it's important to, to consider that you know, in order to go from a level two to a level one, you have to show a tremendous amount of growth. Um, and it's, it's sometimes in a district of our size, a few students in each of these categories can actually move you um, quite, a, quite a lot in percentage points. But we have uh, some, some very good stories here. Our Batchelder and Hood schools are both level one. The Batchelder was actually commended for high achievement this year, which is noteworthy. The Hood School was level one in 2014. They were level one in 2015. If you remember, they would have dropped to level two, but we were held harmless. They, were, they would have dropped because of their assessment participation, but they were held harmless, so they remained level one. And they are once again level one again this year in 2016. So I think that's worth noting. Um, again, held harmless this year for taking park, but not for low participation rates. So um, none of those rates fell below 95% uh, at those schools. Is there any chance that the, the state will remove that punishment for participation rates? I, I just, I, I don't understand it. I, you know, I, I understand there are parents that don't want their children to take the test. I understand we'd like everybody to take mm. the test. But to get punished because people don't take the test, it's almost like it's, a, I, I can't even describe, it's, it's like a, an unfair penalty to the district. I don't yeah. get it. It is to the, to the school and ultimately could be right. to the district, mm -hmm. you're right, for reasons that may be well beyond the control of the school. Exactly. Yeah. I had a lengthy conversation with Robert Lee, who's mm -hmm. the chief analyst I know, for Lee. Yeah. assessment this evening, this afternoon into the evening. And he said it's dictated by the federal government, yeah. the 95%. Uh, so Massachusetts yeah. does not have a choice. Yeah, no choice in the percentage, so we just follow what the federal government is well, telling Well, we'll lose us. money, I assume, if we don't. So. Right. Yeah, okay. right. Yeah, they have to ensure that the students are all taking the assessment because they can link that pretty closely to, to gaps in, in certain communities, so. Um, 
but I do agree that it's, it's, it's and again, it can be one or two students that, that we're watching very closely. Right, with a small they, district. So, yeah. Correct. you know, if we have, you know, seven parents say they don't want their kid to take, and we fall below 95%, it just, yeah. to, to, to penalize the entire district doesn't make sense, or the school and the district doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. But again, they're still in level one and two, which is where we want right. to be. I, I, I know that obviously we all want to be level one, but when you look at schools that have become level one, very often they weren't doing very well and then they did a lot better, <laughs> as opposed to, and a, um, as opposed to you know, consistently high performers. It's, it's very challenging to consistently high perform and to, um, you know, some of the conversations we've had at the schools, we've said, well, we've done a great job. We have no students warning or failing. So you can't earn the points that are needed to now move up to level one because there's no points to be had there. There's all these extra credit points for moving in certain areas. So we came up with these focus areas of improvement. Um, you know, these are the categories you can achieve, above target, on target. We've highlighted improving below target, even though that's positive. We, you're, still, you're still improving, but you're slightly below the target that was set for you. Um, and obviously, if there's no change in your, in your scores or decline, those are areas to participate. You can earn points for ELA, ELA growth, math, math growth, science, technology, engineering, at high school level, dropout rate and graduation rate. And then there's also opportunities for extra credit points as well, um, some of which we are ineligible for. We don't have enough um, ELL students, for example, to, to qualify. And I mentioned about the extra credit for, um, for some of these areas where we might not have students that are failing, so we can't get credit for them moving out of failing. See, part of the, part of the problem, a big part of the problem with this is it's, it's more designed for larger urban school districts. Yeah. I mean, how, how much are we going to improve our dropout rate or our graduation right. rate? You know, I mean, yeah. we might have three kids that very drop little. out. What are we going to have, two the next year? It, right. it's, There's it's very just, little room for growth there. And again, it's, right. it's true. And, and the whole point of the system is to make sure we've identified properly those lowest achieving 20% schools and fixing them. You know, right. so, so again, we're in the green. That's where we need I to I mean, be. that's the whole point of No Child Left Behind in right. every yeah. form was exactly. for the lowest performing mm -hmm. districts. Right. It's yeah. not exactly. a it's district not. like right. North. So it's, right. it's, we can work within this, but it's not designed for us. It's designed, you know, we're a part of it. But we have uh, our high our accountability focus areas looking at the high needs, this, which is made up of students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and English language learners. And we've looked at how many students can we move from proficient to advanced. In this district, a lot of our, that's, that's where a lot of growth can happen. Um, some for moving from warning to needs improvement, and then overall looking at our growth. So where our students are when they move in, you know, we're, we're, not, you know, we're not perfect. We're not the, the highest achieving district in the state, so there's always room for improvement. You know, so there's always room for growth. So we had these individual conferences at the schools. I mentioned that before. Um, we've done a lot of work aligning our development, you know, our departmental and curriculum goals, um, and as well as uh, designing our individual student success plans for students who, who need that improvement. So at the high school, in summary, what we identified in ELA, we want to move more students from proficient to advanced. We want to focus on the high needs and focus on growth. Mathematics, proficient to advanced and growth. And science technology, really looking at students with disabilities. The middle school, we've you know high needs for ELA, advanced and growth. Mathematics, high needs, students with disabilities, needs improvement and growth. So these are areas that we need to move. And then uh, in science, technology, engineering, we really can see all students needing to improve in that area. So that we're going to focus on some different approaches there. The bachelor school, it's really a question of how many students can we move from proficient to advanced. That's what they're going to need to do to, um, to meet some of their targets. The hood school, similar high needs, growth, and then a lot of proficient to advanced. The little school in the same area. They're level two currently, but they've got a lot of high achievement students, so they really need to focus on moving proficient to advanced um, with some growth also for mathematics area. So just to flash forward to what this spring is gonna look like, grades three to eight will take ELA math, um, which will be the MCAS 2.0 assessment. It's, it's this later window, so just to show you that it's more similar to what we've done the last few years now. With MCAS 2.0, it's going to be an April-May window. There's not going to be something earlier in March. Um, the science is going to be between April and May as well. Grade 10 will look a lot uh, more similar to what we've seen in the past few years with an earlier ELA assessment in March with long composition, mathematics in May, and then science in the June window as well. We will, as I mentioned before, paper-based testing in grades three, five, six, and seven in ELA and math. We will do the computers in grades four and eight. 
Um, we're happy that it's going to be similar in its appearance to what we've seen before with PARC, and we're, we're going to be doing all of our testing to prepare um, for that. We don't anticipate any, any issues with that. It actually went pretty well two, two years ago when we did PARC testing as far as everything working properly on the day of the test. So we're, we're very happy with that. And as I mentioned, there's no eighth grade algebra test this year. All the eighth grade students will take the eighth grade test, which they've said if they're taking algebra in eighth grade, they will be more than prepared for those eighth grade standards. Um, just a quick slide about the transitions. So there's currently, uh, we're still testing in science on the 2001-2006 standards. <clears throat> New standards were recently adopted, so this is the last year that we're only assessing those. Next year, so 2018, means that um, we will have both standards, so the old and the new, where there's an overlap. And then by spring of 2019, we will have new assessments fully uh, aligned to the 2016 standards. So we're in a great shape. Our middle school science leaders have led us through. Um, we're perfectly on, on par with this because uh, our s current seventh grade has now had a new curriculum in sixth and seventh. So by next year, they will now have, students will have had three years of the new curriculum aligned to the newer standards, just in time for the testing at that grade level. Um, and by the time they get to high school, those students will have had um, all that as well, so those, that new program, which is great. Grade 10, no changes for this year, at least the current ninth grade class uh, will still continue to take MCAS. There's actually a proposal about the current eighth grade class being the first class to take the new MCAS, and the reason for that is the current ninth graders have never seen MCAS 2.0. So in a lot of districts where they didn't do PARC, they haven't seen anything that even looks like it. So there's a proposal out there to delay it one more year. So this current eighth grade across the state, every student will have seen the new MCAS. So when they take it, when it counts, quote unquote, in high school high stakes, they will have at least seen it. and They won't be seeing it for the first time. So I would anticipate that that likely will happen. We'll probably have this voted through and there'll be at least one more year. And it would be the current eighth graders that would take the new MCAS for graduation. But that's still to be determined. And then the, the SDE standards, again, at least until spring of 18. Any questions? Uh, on the, um, in terms of the amount of testing, I've seen, I've been reading a lot lately, uh, districts talking about or wondering why we can't test in, say, third grade or fourth grade, eighth grade. And is there, you know, in your opinion, is there really a need for these standardized tests every year if we still have the district assessments that are telling us how well our students are doing and, and how, you know, how they're achieving? Yeah, in, in my opinion, and I'm maybe speaking more as <laughs> personally, Patrick Daly, but I think that the accountability is necessary every single grade, every single year in certain districts where there is a large chance that students would slip through the cracks. I exactly. personally think if you're level one or two, that might be a great way to say, hey, maybe level one and twos we could test in just fourth and eighth grade. That's my opinion. I'm a, I haven't vetted well, that, that. That's one. my opinion also. But, well, um, I asked Robert <laughs> yeah, that yeah. tonight. And um, again, it comes down to the mandates. Yeah. And they can't say, okay, North Reading doesn't have to do it, but Springfield does. Right, yeah. So it's just an unfortunate. It's a fed, again, it's because of fed. We tried, that was one of the things that, when I say we, I mean everyone across the country, that was something that people hopefully saw in the new uh, federal legislation. There was a lot of proposals to do something like that, but it didn't quite happen. Um, and it, it would be a logistical, I could imagine that being very, very difficult to manage. But philosophically, I think um, if you're a high achieving district, maybe that's, that's sort of an incentive to get there and to say, you know, let's check in every couple of years. But uh, logistically, I think that would be a challenge and it's not possible at this time. But I know there's a lot going on in Washington around ESSA and there's a lot of, uh, been a lot of meetings between uh, you know, congressmen and senators and challenging different aspects of ESSA. So that's gonna be um, interesting to follow that and see what happens. It's ongoing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pat. Just a comment, if I could, and I want to thank Dr. Daly for a very good good and comprehensive prep, uh, presentation. But I just want to go back to, um, and it, it got, came up briefly at the last meeting, about the meetings that Patrick and I have been having with the principals, the school-based meetings. I think at that time I told you we had completed two of the five. And they really have been very good. Um, 
I'll say, I'll even go so far as to say they exceeded my expectations. That's a level five, I guess. Um, we, we have found the principals to be very thoughtful in the development of an action plan for in anticipation of our meeting with them, of Patrick and I meeting with them. And I think really um, did a nice job in bringing the data to uh, meetings with, um, I'll say either either teachers and or curriculum leaders in their respective schools to, to analyze that data with the, t the data leader and, and, to, and to share with us um, where the, what their thinking was uh, around areas that they saw where they might want to, um, to do better, areas that they saw in, in need of growth. Um, and also trying to um, replicate areas that they found their particular school to be very strong in. The other good thing I think that has been um, positive is that they, the principals have been very free about sharing with other principals um, areas where they found that their school was doing a particularly good job. And, you know, they're, they're having very good, I think, very healthy, trusting conversations with each other, too, around, um, around the data. And, you know, they're seeking to always be better, and I think that's a very consistent message that we got in each of our in each of our five meetings would you agree so I think you know we're you know I, I there's some very good news here but I also think Patrick and I and I, Patrick I hope you don't mind me speaking for you but I think we've seen areas too where we want to focus a little bit more on as a district and we've asked the principals to join us with that and they've been you know kind of it got picked up in the paper last Thursday from a conversation that, that Patrick and I had with Bob Torres but um you know there's, there's some very good work going on and I think we take this this work seriously and and I think one of the good things that has come from it is the the openness to have the conversations and and, and you know try to help each other to to do well. We have two level one schools at the elementary level. People are very proud of that, but a level two is a very good place for us to be, and we're trying to you know solidify that message with folks too. So um, you know we're not resting on our laurels by any stretch, but as a district that does have a pretty good track record of, of high achievement year to year, we do see some areas where we want to we want to focus in on a little bit for this year, and I think. Patrick did a nice job of highlighting that across all five schools. So, just a little commentary. We we, we appreciate. Uh, I, I think I'm speaking for the whole committee here. We appreciate that. We would expect no less. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chair. Nor should you. <laughs> just, just a quick comment. I, I know we have a lot of issues, and um, you know, one of the things that the Mass Association of School Committees has been focused on this year is the, the charter question, but also, um, you know, the foundation budget. But I, but I really think that I'd like to see. I hope Mask gets behind, and, and it's a much bigger rock to push up the hill in terms of changing test, standardized testing because it's yep. a federal mandate. But, but I really do think um, less, I'm not against standardized testing, but fewer tests in fewer grades, especially as, as Dr. Daly said, in districts that are high achieving districts, I think we'll go a long, we'll go a long way. And as Patrick said, it's an incentive for those districts to, to get up into that Correct. high performing area. Yeah. And, and to stay in that area because, you know, you, you don't have to administer as many tests. Now, the administration of it, as I think Julie mentioned, might be a nightmare. But I just, I hope MASK, you know, once we get past this charter thing, at least for this year, and we hopefully get the foundation budget fixed sometime in the next uh, half century, um, can, can start taking a look at, and I know obviously the teachers union is always looking at standardized testing, but I just hope MASK also can spend a little more time on it. I'll use that as an opportunity to uh, point out that the Suburban Coalition has a meeting coming up on November 30th. Yeah. Uh, in the next step, moving, trying to move forward and put some pressure on some legislators yeah, to got that email today. get things going. Uh, let's see, then. anything further on that subject? I hear none, uh, we move on to Next item on agenda, student enrollment projections. On. Great, uh, thank you. So um, it's that time of year again to revisit our student enrollment projections. I do have a short PowerPoint I'm gonna roll through that goes over some of the highlights and talks about some of the trends. I will note that many of the trends that we've spoke of in the past over the last couple of years uh, ring true this year as well. But this is an annual process that it's important um, that we go through and look at our October 1 enrollment numbers every year and see uh, how that impacts future enrollment projections. It has a big impact, obviously, on the budget development process, and it's important to look at this every year. So in terms of the methodology, uh, we kind of use what's referred to as the cohort survival method, and essentially what that means is we're looking at 
uh, trends in enrollment and looking at the number of students that uh, you know move on to the grade the grade from one year to the next as they kind of move through as a cohort moves through their years in North Reading uh, so typically you know we kind of refer to this method as uh, what happened in the past we assume will continue to happen in the future so we develop percentages calculated over historical data over time and we use this data to help determine reliable percent increases or decreases between any two grades into the future. So North Reading's in-migration and, and data has been relatively stable, so typically we use a 10-year trend um, in that data to develop a reliable percentages to project enrollment into the future. Um, obviously, we need to look at some changes in recent residential developments and, and turnover in homes. All of these things can certainly will and have an impact on enrollment projections and we're starting to certainly see that in North Reading. There's a increased turnover in, in homes and some residential and, and some developments and um, that we certainly anticipate in the future will impact some of the enrollment numbers that I, I will go over this evening. Um, really quick, just looking at our enrollment history uh, over the last you know 60 plus years and you're looking at student enrollment that almost has sort of two bell curves to it. Um, enrollment that's kind of certainly peaked through the 1960s as we approach 1970. Uh, enrollment um, grew to almost 3,217 students. Um, it, it reached a, a high in the 1970s of 3,461. Uh, in the 1980s, you then saw the decline occur and then it began to rise again in the 1990s. Uh, peaking at 2,319 students there. Um, and then the period, uh, you know, since then, there's been growth back to 2,812 students in 2008. And since fiscal year 2008, we have been on somewhat of a steady decline um, um, since, since about fiscal year 2008. This is our last 10 years of enrollment history, um, historical enrollment again over the last 10 years has remained relatively stable. I just mentioned to be at a, a peak in fiscal year 2008 as you can see by the bar graph here. And then enrollment has been on somewhat of a decline. We did experience a small increase in fiscal year 2014. But most recently our enrollment uh, based on the October 1 counts has declined by a total of 33 students district wide from fiscal 2016 to 17. And what we're seeing here, not you know, unlike other years that we looked at enrollment, is we feel the two factors that are having the greatest impact on North Reading's enrollment is there's been a steady number of births uh, when compared to North Reading residents, and as well as the beginning of a, an emerge a merger of new in migration uh, into North Reading, which for a period of time had slowed due to the real estate slowdown and the, the economic recession around 2008, 2009. But we're now seeing that show evidence of, re, of uh, picking up as in-migration returns to North Reading and the real estate market recovers. So we do feel that there's evidence of this. So in the outer years, a lot of these projected declines will, will moderate over time. When we look to the future, again, district-wide, we see that our enrollment is again expected to decline relatively over the next decade. Um, how, however, as I just said, one should realize that these patents really will not last over the next 10 years. Um, these projections are most reliable in years kind of one through five and the outer years, years six through 10, they're, they're less reliable and will obviously need to be updated this and that's why we do this on an annual process. As I just said, there's the economy and real estate situation is improving in the region. And this has shown evidence of a return of in-migration and, and new families and homes turning over in North Reading, which will impact these numbers in the outer years. Um, for example, between 2003 and 2007, there were 100, on average, about 161 single family homes sold. Um, however, over the last few years, this number has been a lot higher. There was 173, 181 homes in 2013, 173 in 2014. Just recently in 2015, again, the number was 174. 
And so far through 2016, the pace is running higher than in 2015. We're looking at about 186 uh, at this point through calendar year 2016. So if this trend continues, uh, it will certainly impact these projections um, you know, as we get past the first few years here. Um, as the prices of homes climb and become closer to their pre-recession levels, we do think it's very possible that kind of the baby boomer generation may be uh, waiting to downsize. They'll be encouraged to place their homes on the market. And if this does occur, you'll see even more young families move into North Reading. So you'll see potential uh, an increase in, in, in new students. The next chart quickly looks at um, in-grade combinations of projected enrollment. Uh, you, you can see that you know, we look at essentially in uh, you know, pre-K through five and grades K through five, the middle school grades six through eight, and you know, certainly the high school nine through 12. So you can see some of these changes over the next three to five to even 10 years in the chart. Um, essentially, K through five enrollments are forecasted to remain relatively stable. Um, you know, going up by about two students, projected students next year, um, increasing up into the mid 1,070s over the next couple, you know, few years, um, and getting close to even 2,000 and as we approach four or five years into the future. Um, but again, relatively stable, but slightly increasing enrollment. Uh, the biggest change is at the middle school level, where we have currently have 577 students. And we are projecting a decline of only you know, 47 students next year. So we are, and that's the biggest you know, changes are, we're seeing at the middle school level in the near future. Um, the high school level, we've reached almost an all-time high in the last you know, over a decade of 813 students this year at the high school level. That level is expected to remain high at least for another year at 811 students before the high school would experience kind of a drop in enrollment as the smaller grade levels from the middle school work their way up to the high school. I will just note, it's certainly very possible, but based on a lot of the factors with the economy and the real estate and the situation in the market that I just spoke to, um, will certainly bring additional new families to North Reading and will impact these projections in the outer years, um, you know, beyond three, four, or five years. I don't think we'll ever experience the, the decline that you're maybe seeing in this chart. I think though, these, this decline will moderate, um, but you know, so this is certainly what, what the trends are showing right now. So the next few charts just break down by level. Uh, this, this part by bar graph shows, it focuses on elementary enrollment, and you just, I just spoke to um, some of the changes in the projections over the next three to, to five years, and you, you can see that it's remaining relatively stable, but slightly increasing at the elementary level. Um, that's mostly can be contributed to the number of births as the number of North Reading births um, are, have been, you know, pretty, have been rising since around 2008 or five or six years earlier from these projections, which will, will eventually start impacting you know, the elementary en enrollment numbers. At the middle school level, I uh, just spoke to, this is where we'll see the most, I guess, significant decline is projected at the middle school level next year, where over the next three years, we could see a decline as, as, as much as by 57 students. Um, as you can see by the above chart, long-term enrollment projections indicate that middle school enrollment will reach, uh, had reached a 10-year peak in 2014 at 682, and then we've been experiencing a, a decline you know, since. Um, and that decline expected to continue through over, you know, over the next five years before in, you know, five years out in fiscal year 2022, they start to see a little bit of an increase 2021-2022. At the high school enrollment, this is where we've had the biggest level of focus, I would say, in the last uh, you know, three or four budget cycles as we've seen a huge increase at the high school. You can see back in 2014, we had about 756 students. And it's been on a steady rise over the, over the last three years, and that rise is expected to stay certainly above 800 students, around 811 next year. Um, certainly the opening of the new building has very much contributed to a higher percentage of students uh, remaining in North Reading if they move from eighth grade to ninth grade. Um, it's been talked about, and we one time saw that 
ratio of students uh, you know, moving on to be as high or, or leaving North Reading to be as high as 12 or 13 percent. And we're now seeing that more around 4 or 5 percent, so um, you know, which has not the, the only factor, but a, a, certainly a, a key factor in some of the increase in the enrollment over these last three, three or four years at the high school level. Uh, but certainly fiscal year 2008, we'll continue to see the high school uh, have a high enrollment around 811 students. So that's kind of the, the numbers and is similarly to the last couple years, our district-wide enrollment expected to experience you know, a slight decline each year over the next decade. I will note again though, these patents you know, will not last as long as what we're showing you know, on the outer years, five to 10 years out. Um, we are seeing strong evidence that the real estate market is improving and migration is returning to North Reading. There is evidence of this being the case and I think we'll see these projections moderate over the, you know, beyond three or four years in the projections currently. Um, so that being said, I'll just open it up to discussion and questions. Um, also in your packet was a kind of a detailed narrative report that encompassed a lot of the, part, the graphs and charts uh, that I just went through in the, in the PowerPoint, um, as well as the official October 1 enrollment counts by level and by grade and by school um, was also included in your packet as well. Mr. Chair, that's probably more of a question for Superintendent Bernard, but if Michael can chime in also, but I know that we've taken advantage of the drop in student population at the middle school. I think we reduced a couple of teachers two years ago. Two years ago, yes. I mean, looking at these numbers, if these numbers ring true, would there be more of an opportunity to shift resources from middle school to high school? Maybe not. I mean, next year we're showing a 32 student mm -hmm. drop, and then, you know, from this year to 2018, we're showing an almost 80 student drop. Would that maybe open up some opportunities, or is it the way the teams are structured? It That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, the team structure makes it difficult to just remove a, a teacher from the team because the team needs balance. But it is something we've had a preliminary discussion around as we've seen, you know, what monetary projections look like for fiscal year 18 against where we want to be as a district based on school committee goals and our PS 2021 and such. So the conversation has happened, but I think the, the kind of, for lack of a better term, the logistical complications around the team concept make it difficult to do that. Plus, we also have been talking, you know, again, in a very preliminary way about um, programs being added at the middle school, right. whether it be foreign language, STEM, you know, those are kind of on the, on the, on the docket right now too, so. Um, but I think as, as the budget development plays itself out, you know, we might be needing to have, you know, more conversation around something like that. It, it looks to me like where we have these large classes moving through, and once they're through, we drop down to around 2,400 and kind of settle in around 2,400, mm -hmm. plus or minus mm -hmm. 30 or 40 right. um, uh, from there on out. I think that's right. Yep, I would say that's fair. Uh, it, it, There's a definite bubble. It's, it, the, the bubble is, is passing through. and. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're going to settle in on, on the, the 2400. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah. Uh, I just want to comment that if you look at the uh, numbers from 2008 to 2016, we've had about a 10% reduction in, in enrollment, which translates to about 280 students. But again, as we pointed out before, if you spread that out over 12 grades right. and five schools, it doesn't necessarily uh, correlate with us reducing. That's right. Teaching staff, not yet. I mean, I think it's it's getting close. Maybe if you look at some of the elementary school class sizes that we have to start <clears throat> looking at some of those. But it's it's hard, even with that 10% decline in enrollment, because extraordinarily the enrollment from, I mean, um, the enrollment from 1992 to 2008 increased from 1,800 to 2,812. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was that time frame when we were really struggling. Right trying to find different um, different ways to, including the override. Right, we had an operating override. The, over, right. the override in 2003, the ARA funds for, right. for Federal four, ARA five, funds, and six, five, six, and seven. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of things, uh, draining uh, one uh, time. accounts, one-time right. revenues. 
to, to basically keep up with that growth. But I think it's going to be a little bit more difficult to go the other way because, yeah. again, even with a 10 percent decline in enrollment spread out that, that much, it's, it's difficult to reduce staffing, plus all the other demands that are on the That's school right. district now. That's the That's other right. problem. Well, we have so. two problems. We, we can't. So we get class sizes that, and, and I'm a huge advocate of small class sizes, but we're getting class sizes that are really small at the elementary level, but you can't, you can't break it down from, you can't go from three to two because then the class sizes are too big. And then on the other hand, and I know we've done things to address the issue at the high school and things are better this year, but we still have, in my opinion, too many classes with 30 or more, and we can't, we can't shift resources because we still need those resources at the at the elementary level but so we can't and, and we're right at that number if you look at some of the elementary school right. class sizes mm -hmm. right. we're right at the number of you know we have it's great to have a third grade class with 17 16 and 18 but if you try to break that down to two you go to 25 and 26 right. you know you got a first grade class with 20 20 17 and 19 you break it down to three you go 25 25 26 right. um, the, the fourth grade class at the hood you got 17, 15, and 20, but if you want to go with two, it's 27 and 27. Exactly. Right. And then you have students in there that require additional, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, services, services too. So it's it's we're just not there necessarily in trying to reduce the uh, the staffing. Yeah, those numbers of 50, 51, 52, 54. Yeah. You know, those those are very. It might be one place maybe where you can make a change, and then you don't know from one year to the next whether that class Correct. size might go up by two students or yeah. three students. Uh, Anything further? Just inter it is interesting at how going forward we do we are looking at a decline, but yeah. it's pretty stable. It's mm. Stable. Yeah. Um, the other question I had was, and this is looking out three or four years, maybe longer. You know, so we're gonna we're gonna have our first six or seven years at the high school where we have more students than the high school was built for, and then it's looking like after that we drop off. If at some point we get to a point where we have you know 100 students less than the school is mm -hmm. built for, is that a time where we can look at working with a seam or another collaborative and, and leasing out space to them? I would if, say absolutely. Uh, to, for for yeah. revenue purposes? We've act actually been looking at that even now. Right, right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, thank, thank you, Michael. Right, that brings us to routine matters. And uh, the first item is uh, the Open session minutes for October 11. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Uh, next is October 12th, open session. That's the joint meeting with uh, Board of Selectmen and FinCom. A move to approve as written. I'd say that uh, the, uh, the, the Notation here is to 2017. It probably ought to be 2016. No, it says 16. Where does it say 17? Oh, in the report. Oh, oh yeah, in the, min on the in my report it does. Oh, in your mm -hmm. report it does. Okay, on on the minutes it's correct. Yes. Right. Uh, second. Sorry. Right. That's all right. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Janine. And the uh, open session meeting on October 17th. Move to approve as written. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. And that moves us on to a budget update. Mr. Conley. Thank you very much. So in your packet this evening uh, was the October budget update, essentially reflecting activity through about the, the middle of October. Um, as we discussed in the past, and certainly that has been a trend, um, you know, on a monthly basis here, you're seeing, um, you know, some funds available in the special education tuition counts. That's really the result of us prepaying at the end of fiscal 2016 and exceeding the, the budgeted or planned forecasted amount. Uh, this again will help us address some unforeseen costs, and um, I think you know should should we need to to, to do so. Um, on the expense side, you're certainly seeing more of the funds expended um, in all the major categories at this point in the year from the September report. So I think it's certainly fair to say that all the necessary supplies to start the school year and so forth have been ordered or a lot of the year-end um, supplies and things that are anticipated have been encumbered or committed at this point by principals and budget leaders. Um, 
We have encumbered all utility expenses and we will we'll certainly continue to monitor the cost of utilities closely um, this fiscal year. We're working very closely with Automated Logic and that Energy Management Service contract. We're seeing benefits of having that service agreement um, and those, those monthly visits to regulate and set the occupancy schedules of this building as well as throughout the district. So um, we'll continue to monitor that closely. Um, you know, you're certainly, uh, you're seeing some expenses on the operations and maintenance side um, that seem to be high through the first quarter of the fiscal year. Uh, that's something that we're taking notice of. And you see the high amounts already noted in the committed column. Um, and that's because we're trying to do our best to forecast and project, project the um, needed expenses in, this, in these areas around building maintenance, maintenance of buildings and grounds, custodial services, and so forth. Um, so we're continuing to, to watch those numbers closely, continuing to meet with uh, Wayne regularly and, and monitor the, the, the cost, but we're certainly seeing, seeing those expenses um, throughout the first quarter of the fiscal year. Um, the food service program, I wanted to just note that they did close out the month of September with a small profit of a little over 4000 uh, dollars, which is encouraging, given that the month of September tends to be a challenging month. Uh, we saw the mail sold um, throughout the, the district at each school be uh, somewhat similar to a year ago, it's maybe a slight 1 or 2 percent increase in areas in September. Um, but they did a good job at controlling expenses, startup expenses this year, which I think was the main reason that we, we ended with a small profit. I have not gotten the final month, October, has not been officially closed out. We'll probably will we'll do that this week. Um, I think it's a small loss in October, um, is what I'm being told. Um, as you know, we, we started the breakfast program. Uh, that started, that program started kind of slowly in September. There was a total of 72 uh, breakfasts sold the month of September. But in, we're seeing that kind of start to pick up, and there was 148 uh, total of breakfast sold in the month of October. So we're going to watch that closely. Um, so overall, I think between September and October, I did look at some of the numbers. I think we're looking at mail sold, um, average mail sold per day at the elementary level is similar to last school year. And they were up between 3 and 4 percent at the middle school and high school compared to last school year. And as we recall, last school year, you had the middle school up on average 28, mm. 29 percent and the high school up about 9 percent. So. So the, the program's you know, doing, doing okay at this point in the year. Um, on the payroll side, you may recall during the budget process, process we did budget a, kind of a higher than typical staff turnover attrition savings amount. So we, I think it's fair to say, um, although there's no really concern that the, maybe the projected balance in some of the salary line items, particularly for teachers, is maybe a little bit lower than it has been in the past at this point in the year. Um, so it's just something we'll continue to, to monitor. Uh, we are once again seeing a need to fill extended leave of absences and appoint long-term subs, although I don't see that being, at this point in the year anyway, as high as it was the last two years. We really saw a lot of that in fiscal 15 and 16. It's, it's certainly happening, but it has not been as high, so that should certainly help the substitute uh, budget account so far, but it's, it's obviously very early in the year. Um, but, you know, I think most payroll projections at this time indicate that they're very close to budgeted amounts. And, um, you know, so far throughout the first little more than a quarter of the fiscal year, we seem to be in, in okay shape, although they're certainly we're seeing some expenses that we need to watch in certain areas, operations and maintenance being one, as, as well as in the utilities and so forth. So, uh, open up to any, any questions. Mr. Chair. Yes. Just a quick comment. Uh, you mentioned the surplus in the uh, special ed tuition area, but it's not like it's a, you know a, a windfall. It's ninety five thousand dollars, which yeah. one that's placement right. could wipe that out. Windfalls. A half a placement could that's wipe correct. that out. So, so we, went, we exceeded about a hundred thousand dollars of what we had forecasted in our prepayment. So I think that's kind of what you're seeing there. Um, you know, I think there there are things that we have to. I'm meeting with. Cynthia Conant regularly. I have a meeting with her on Wednesday this week to, to see what changes and what expenses could be on the rise. So uh, the good thing I will say is that the circuit breaker account is in, is in relatively healthy okay. you know, shape. We had increased that budgeted offset in fiscal 17 to up to 760000 and that had included 
an anticipated FY17 um, revenue about based, again, based on prior year expenses of around 675,000, 700,000, which is essentially what we're getting. And we, we had anticipated using about $100,000 of um, money that was as a reserve carryover money. So I think there's a little bit more than that. So we'll have to just, Good. you know, so we have a little bit of money and flexibility in circuit breaker, a little bit of money here in the general fund. Again, not, not a lot, but there's a little bit there should, should we need to. Well, because you're caught in that game now. If you don't have money to prepay at the end of the that's fiscal right. year, you're going to be in trouble mm -hmm. in the next fiscal Victory. year. In that cycle where and that's we're, what's we're making me nervous about some of these mm -hmm. some of these numbers. Yeah, I'm just not as confident this year. It's a fair note. It's certainly getting to the point where those those surpluses that we've relied on actually at, at, at getting squeezed. Yeah. Um, and you know there could be situations where we have to go into use some of that, and, and that might mean there's less at the end of this year. You know. If, if we've been able to be relatively conservative and plan for things and, and be able to, we've had a lot of, we've had some pretty uh, positive closeouts. We've done a lot of things to, to put ourselves in relatively solid financial standing the subsequent fiscal year, but we're seeing that some of that be squeezed a little bit here. That we are just not in any, you know, situation where we need to be highly concerned about, but it's something that we need to just watch and monitor, in my opinion. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, if there's one other note, I just, I just wanted to take a moment during the budget update to let you know that, um, you know, the business office, uh, in the, particularly the budget page of the website, we have made some updates to, um, I recently made an update to the, the budget page. So if you go to the business office, there's a lot of helpful links here that we've worked on to try to make things more user friendly and more accessible and easy, easier for the public to read some of this information. Um, one, one such link is the budget page. So I recently um, made some changes. Obviously, you know, we have an NRPS Finance Twitter account that we post updates regularly, so you can access that information right here on the budget link. Um, the FY18 budget calendar has been loaded, all the key dates of, of um, the presentation that some of that which have already occurred, the, the large capital plan and the school community budget goals, which happened in September. I'll post the enrollment projection presentation that we heard this evening, uh, probably tomorrow morning. So that will be, this link here will be hyperlinked. So these are hyperlinked. Uh, so you can click on and they'll, they'll, these presentations open up and that data is available. Um, all prior year budget information is down here at the bottom of the calendar, so this all this information will be updated as we move throughout the process. Um, this kind of a running tally of helpful information of our fiscal year 2017 budget. This is one of the, the end of the year uh, presentation, PowerPoint presentations that does kind of circulate and um, kind of run through with some highlights of fiscal 2017. And then over here, there's some helpful links that bring you to certain DSC, DESC websites that talk about federal and state grants, Chapter 70 information, some pure approval spending data. So if you click on these links, it does open up some helpful information about various budget topics um, and so forth. So that information is there. So what I, again, as, as part of our, our budget goals, you know, as we get into the, the, the heart of the budget season, you know, January, February, March, I will be posting videos on certain topics, at least, and those links will be here to the left side. Um, you know, it, will, it will highlight the topic, and you would click, and it would be a short video. This is one video that uh, we found that's a helpful video about the foundation budget and how the foundation budget is calculated and so forth. So that information was out there from the Mass Budget website. So. Just some, uh, you know, just so the public is aware, this information is readily updated throughout the process. So, so here's a suggestion: uh, Could we, like, on a, a fairly regular basis, send out an email to all parents saying we've added this new information to the budget, uh, you know, to the business office website, um, you know, links to X, Y, and Z, the enrollment. People always say we don't provide enough information. I know we do, and I know it might sound like excessive hand-holding, but the more hand-holding we can do to get people to go to these places, I think the better off we are. I'm not saying every week, every month. I'm saying maybe every two months you say, 
you you blast out an email that say there, you know there's there's new content on this page that page and that page some of the features x y and z and then you're done that, that's it no explanation no i don't want to speak for michael I, you know i don't think it seems like an overwhelming task to do i will just add one of the new features of the new websites is that if parents sign up for the notify me alert they'll get that con they'll get an, uh, an alert that when tells them when the added. content has been added. Patrick, am I correct in that? Now, have parents been told to sign up for that? Many times. Okay. <laughs> yes, including including in my newsletter that you have a copy of tonight. I saw that. Okay. <laughs> All right. And just, um, but it's not. It's a it's a reminder, and I do know that people get caught up in the busy day to day life that they lead. But I, I you know, as I send out periodic email blasts, I'm happy to add a little footnote of like something my, like my tonight. So you get the new enrollment exactly. data up there, yeah. and then you can highlight yeah. some of the other things. I, I if think you don't understand the foundation budget. Here's yeah. a link to this video. I think we could we could, we right. could work toward that. I, I do tweet out when I post something new and say check out this yeah, new see. link. Um, yeah. I'm trying to increase my following base as well. But uh, <laughs> so yeah, so so retweet retweet voice. Michael if you He's get just a not as popular as if you, you got to retweet the superintendent. We try to retweet Michael as frequently yep. as we can. So I know with a lot of things, and since the facility rental, we did this a few months ago, but now there's a lot of good information yeah. here about the yeah. facility yeah. rental. There's a running slideshow nice of all of our spaces nice that yeah. circulates. Oh, that's great. Um, so that, you know, here's the DLL. And what a beautiful so school. There's a lot of information <laughs> there. Where is that? Um, you know, the food service link it's, has it's a lot like, of helpful information. There's just well. a wealth of information on the website. And, there is. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know parents say they, they have a hard time finding it. It's, it's there. And, it, you know, go to the business look. office page or there's just a lot of info. It's not as good as misinformation. No. <laughs> that's good. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's no staffing. Uh, next item on our agenda is bids and donations. We have eight donations. Uh, will you do the honors again? Yeah. I'll, I'll do it. All right. I'll All right. All right. First bid we have is a, uh, a, a excuse me, donation. First donation. <laughs> Not a bid. Donation is from uh, Brad Jones. Is this Brad Jones Jr. Brad Jones? State, State, rep State Representative Brad Jones. Representative Brad Jones. It's uh, an American flag valued at fifty dollars. It's now, I believe, it's now flying at the Arthur J. Kennedy Athletic Field. The old flag was in uh, difficult condition, and we now have a, a new flag that's that's lighted nicely at night. So I will uh, make a motion to accept with gratitude the American flag from State Representative Brad Jones. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. All those opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much, Representative Jones. I move to accept with gratitude a gift of $102.37 from the Little School PTO for a Scholastic Magazine subscription for a class at the Little Elementary School. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Next, I move to accept with gratitude gift of $300 from the North Reading Youth Volleyball Association to support costs associated with upgrades to North Reading High School middle school athletic facilities including an irrigation system. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Just, just for discussion, but actually what should come before the vote, but that was very nice of uh, youth volleyball to do that. I mean, it's not as if they're going to directly benefit from no. the new. Kids that play volleyball might, will probably be using those fields, yeah. but they're but, not going to be playing volleyball. But that was volleyball a volleyball on very much appreciated. Yes. Very nice donation. Much appreciated. It's, it's very nice for each of these donations. Yes. Yeah, it is. And it, they're are very much appreciated. Next, I move to accept with gratitude eight books from donorschoose.org valued at $304.48 for the purpose of implementing a project in Ms. Mahoney's classroom at the J. Turner Hood Elementary School. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Move to accept with gratitude the amount of $619.94 from the Batchelder Parent Organization for the purchase of a Little Bits STEAM student set to pilot the makerspace unit at the Batchelder Elementary School. Second. Before we vote on this, just to <laughs> explain, this is something when we went to the Hood School last year, we were introduced to their new maker class where basically kids make things. They use technology to make things. Um, in some cases, you know, maybe in the future there'll be 3D printers, but 
they make things they hands on how things work how to build things and I think this is great and, and not just technology right not and just building things it, and it, I think it's great it, it, and I do too if I could just add mr. chairman mr. McKay's around the schoolyard article Thursday will be a follow-up on, on the, the implementation of the maker spits very interesting Excellent. Uh, steam a little bits steam student set as in a steam iron steam. it is it is in the memo Cindy steam trap anyway, so motion made with Second. all those in favor aye. Aye. aye unanimous move to accept a two thousand four hundred seventy one dollar donation from the middle school parents is this parents or the parents association just parents? It was, yes from middle school parents to purchase planners for middle school students. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Hmm. Move to accept with gratitude a donation of $3,290 from the Batchelder Parent Organization for a portable hexagon octopit for the Batchelder School Playground. I'd like to I see that. I think you need to point out it's a 20 foot diameter. Yes, I, w I, w I would like to see that 20 foot diameter octopit. I think we should have one at every school. <laughs> Second. The, what, what is it? I'm wait, I thank you for asking. I, I said to Mr. Klee, they're going to ask me what I, that is. I, I need just, to know what I'm it just, is. I'm just it curious. Arrived, it arrived I mean, on Thursday. He explained it to me, and I'm still not sure I know exactly what it is. But it's a uh, it's it's for the physical education classes. It's a it's a that's kind of a phys ed game type, you know. But it arrived on Thursday. Is what he told. We should have got the forty foot one. I told him I would be by to see right. it. <laughs> I move. That was second. I second. Yeah. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Now this next Unanimous. one has some backup um, work yeah. to it. This it is does. A, a major project that's been going on. Mr. Brown, I don't know if you want to provide a little background before you. Yeah, I think between Mr. Connolly and I, but essentially the Little School Parents Association has um, donated to the school district the first of um, uh, several donations I think that are due to come. Um, this one tonight for twenty-five thousand dollars for the um, the playground project at the little school. So. Um, this has been an ongoing fundraising effort of the um, Little School PTO. They've done a wonderful job. They have a fantastic plan laid out here from a contractor. I gave you a, um, copies of a packet that Mr. Connolly had shared with me to just kind of give you a visual of um, the plan. Um, they are very close to having the full amount secured. It's, this is about a $100,000 project. Wow. Mm. Um, Mr. Connolly has been heavily involved with the PTO of the little school, um, there were some requirement, legal requirements that needed to be, um, I'll say, kind of ironed out as to whether or not, you know, what the best approach was going to be in order for the donations to come um, to the school department to, to, to make this project come true. Um, so we, we did check with council, um, got some very good, I, I would say, very detailed feedback about the processes for accepting the the funds in order to work with the PTO to um, to have the, the project complete. Michael, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, no, I think that's that's accurate. So um, again, they're very close to their fundraising goal. This would be kind of phase one. What this allows us to do is this 25,000 donation would essentially allow us to issue a purchase order for about um, you know 25 percent deposit down in the form of a school purchase order once the funds are accepted and deposited and that would lock in the pricing that they've been working with with the selected vendor um they would the timeline for that is to lock in pricing so everything is the same as december 1st um they are continuing fundraising efforts but they're very close so there'll be another large fundraising effort happening um and i th you know i see either a, a, a larger check being presented in february and maybe a, another one in March as we get closer to the project coming to um, completion. Th essentially, the timeline of the project is that we would issue a purchase order for 25%, lock in the pricing. Uh, the vendor then wouldn't actually order the equipment until about the beginning of March or so. Um, the equipment would be delivered during the April vacation week, and then it, it's due to be installed uh, during uh, the weekend of April 29th and 30th. So that if everything goes to plan, that's how the, the project would play out. Um, so, you know, essentially, um, you know, it, we've checked with legal counsel and it, it, it actually is, the project is exempt from Chapter 30B. Um, and, you know, they, the vendor also, though, is a state contract vendor. 
um, as well. Um, but it is, ex it is, it does meet the exemption of Chapter 30B. It does fall under Chapter 30B, not Chapter 149, like the field project, for instance. Um, so I think it's, I think they have, it's been very uh, well organized. I met with the little school PTO representatives. I met with the, the, the vendor uh, early last week, and I think they're certainly, you know, been working hard to make this, you know, come to fruition. Those of you who don't know, the, the little school uh, playground equipment is pretty much at the end of its life cycle. Yep. And this is a much needed project. I, is it in the same location as the current playground, or are they relocating it? It's going to be in that same location. That same location. Yeah. The back, the, the, the yeah. far side, yeah. the yeah. far right hand side of the parking right. lot area. Yeah. 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 The, the other one is no longer okay. in the middle of the parking lot. Right. So there were some quotes that they had received that was in included. And, um, so, you know, the, it is going to involve some site work as well to get the site prepared, which they're still getting quotes on uh, as well. But um, there will be some, some grading and some preparing the site. So. Move to accept with gratitude a donation of $25,000 from the E at the Little School PTO to support funding of a new play playground at the school. Second. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much to everybody. Another um, tremendously generous night here. Mm -hmm. um, you take these, you take the field project and this project, that's about $225,000 um, raised just for those two projects alone. And Not just even a, counting everything else. Just we, a few months. Right, a few months. The, the generosity of the community beyond the tax roll right. is awesome. Next item on our agenda is uh, subcommittee updates. Finance planning team met on October 12th. Um, it was a, a pretty um, non-exciting meeting. I would say we spent most of the time on reviewing the warrant for town meeting, in right. particular right. the article dealing with the bathrooms right. uh, down at the, uh, the Kenny Field. And we went back and forth with the Finance Committee and the uh, School Committee and the Board of Selectmen and, and uh, discussed the various options that were presented to us for the bathrooms. Uh, couldn't necessarily come to a consensus at that point in time, uh, although it seemed like people were trending towards a mm -hmm. particular option that would have included building a, um, a bathroom facility and a uh, concession stand with the current concession stand is located that seemed to be the trend at the time and then prior to town meeting that kind of fell apart but uh, I would say that we talked primarily about not just that article but the other the other monetary articles that were on the uh, on the warrant I don't know anything else John that we no I mean we, we we continue to you know I think the little school roof project came up again uh, yeah, and, you know, where, where we, we were at and, and they have a little update for and you there was the usual yeah. projections of Re available revenue funds mm -hmm. uh, available and and uh, expectations of uh, future revenue and and uh, expenses. But that was the, we didn't do too much with you know revenues or budgets for the next. A little early. No, yeah. it's pretty early. Yeah. So. I, and uh, the athletic subcommittee met on uh, October 25th. We did. Uh, we talked about the status of the revolving account for fiscal year 2017. Uh, although our balance at the end of the year will, is projected to be less than last year, it's still going to be about $11,000. Um, we did talk about the laboratory facilities at the Arthur Kenny Field and talked about, again, which was the best way to proceed, and I think there was a consensus amongst the uh, uh, athletic subcommittee men meeting members that we go with the option that we talked about that was the uh, um, bathroom facilities and the concession stand located and again in the area of the current concession stand that was our recommendation we talked what we've already talked about tonight was the cooperative ski team mr. Johnson gave us a, uh, a presentation on that the girls ice hockey team again it'll be a co-op team with uh, Linfield and Peabody again this year I think it's what, now the third year in a row third, third, fourth year, yeah. uh, fourth third year. year. Yeah. And it seems to be working out fine um, talked about the athletic uh, facilities committee um, so I'm gonna turn that over to actually to Mel to to update us on that. Uh, you know, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but we, you know, and I'm talking about all the generous, generosity from the community, but we still, you know, we still need funds to complete this project. Um, you know, we, in addition to, the field looks great. The, the sod's down, the irrigation's working, the water pressure's great. Yep. We've had a lot of rain. Uh, it's, it looks it's good. Just, it looks good. 
Um, you know, Marty Tilton from Parks and Rec has played a big role in coordinating, and Marty says, you know, don't worry that there's different colors. That always happens when you put the side uh -huh. down. You're not going to have every piece of side from the same, you know, the same batch, basically. But it looks good. Um, we're keeping people off the field. Um, but we need money. And we need money to, we still need money to pay off. You know, we, we, we've essentially borrowed money from the uh, Athletic Revolving Fund that we need to pay back. And you know we. Yeah, what, what's the number, Mel? We've twenty three thousand. Twenty three eight seventy five. Twenty four thousand dollars. So we we're kind of in debt to the school department. Yes. Twenty three thousand dollars. Eight hundred dollars. And, and, we, we we have, and then we also have you know a, a lot of equipment that if we're going to use these fields, mm -hmm. we need equipment on the fields. We mm -hmm. need soccer goals. We need bleachers. We need bleachers at the. We, I mean, we could get by without bleachers yeah. at the at the softball field, but you really should have a place for people to sit down. Yeah. Uh, we need to put gates up. We need. Uh, we we really. You don't need dug a scoreboard, but you can have a scoreboard. Dugout you enclosures. Dugout enclosures, uh, batting cages, pitching machines if, if possible. Bringing electricity out from the, uh, you know, where the current electricity is to, so you can plug in a batting mm -hmm. cage and plug in a scoreboard and, and things like that. Um, we have prices on some of this stuff, too. We, we, right. In fact, at our next meeting, we've Correct. asked to get a price on everything right. that would be on our wish list. One of the things so that I was hoping to do, and I don't about. think I'm going to make it for this deadline, um, but we have time is um, I, I've been in contact with the um, um, Reading, Co Reading Cooperative Bank. Bank and they I think it's six times a year they review applications for funds uh, the woman I spoke with said that this definitely qualifies she didn't say we'd get get funds and they award up to ten thousand dollars I great. need more Tell take it. I need more specific money I mean numbers from yeah. from the athletic director and he's working to get me those I don't think we're going to make this deadline, but we'll make the next one. Yeah, we had prices like I think the electrical was going to be eighteen hundred ninety-two dollars. Yeah, so it like sounds that. like we do have a quote. We, we had, had gates, goals, gates, gates for the dugouts was seventeen hundred fifty-eight dollars. Yep. So right. some of these, uh, Mel, have we scheduled another meeting for the athletic facility? No, we need. We to, should do that. I was I was waiting until. We that. Um, yeah, I get the numbers from Dave uh, Johnson though. I want to okay, have yeah. all the numbers all right, that's good. before we schedule a meeting. Because we so need I can to update say, look, the committee. We need twenty-four thousand plus. You know, twelve thousand or whatever it's going to be for a for a school board, etc. Um, yeah. To, but you know, all in all, it's we collected well over one hundred thirty thousand uh, dollars. Again, huge generosity from the community, especially the I, I got to mention North Reading Youth Soccer with the seventy-five thousand dollars. We never would have been able to complete this project, and it looks good. And, and I, people were commenting really on it nice. this weekend, saying how great the yeah. fields look. And just a segue, and another thing that we talked about at the end of the meeting was the. Uh, uh, field maintenance, um, oh, right. that's the cooperative, collaborative effort with the school department and Parks and Rec. And Marty Tilton told us, he said that uh, um, Ipswich River Park, the fields are pretty much worn out and right. it's going to have to start closing fields. And that makes it more imperative that we have mm. the practice field that we, we just got through sodding and irrigating because that field's a huge, you can have three soccer oh, yeah. teams practicing on that at Can't one time. Right, but the bottom line is the, the fields in the spring are going to be closed down, or some of them are going to be closed down at Ipswich River Park. So we absolutely positively need that space, and, and it's a good thing we move forward because otherwise we wouldn't have it. One other thing I wanted to mention um, related to the turf field is I know that the, the, a lot of all the residue was, was cleaned off the surface of the turf field and the track, but we have three places that are stained really yes. deeply down there. And yeah, we're, we're aware of that. The gentleman knows he'll come back. He felt like he, you know, he did what he could do to at that time. Right. And what, he said it, there will be time when he needs to come back, but he also said it's, it's going to wear itself out, too, in a good way. I mean, right. it's just yeah, yeah. It's the remaining residue. But the other thing I'm wondering we, is, since the cause of that was, again, my opinion, not properly left um, landscaping at the field area, is there any chance of us recouping costs that they're paying for the whole thing? They have. Oh yeah, the project. We're not paying for any they of it. They pay for the cleaning and everything. Absolutely. Okay. They have the bills. Sure. And again, I I didn't qualify Mel's statements earlier tonight, but I will say it again that we have held the contract, the architect, and the project manager. They held their feet to the fire on every one of the issues we've talked mm -hmm. about. They are here. They are responsive. They are dealing with the issues, the drainage, the landscaping, the HVAC, all of those things. And we're not going to let them off the site until we're satisfied that uh, everything is done. I'm extremely pleased to hear that because I had heard some of the costs coming in, and I was like, well, "How are we going to absorb?" It's not. That it in was our not cheap. Or parks and I, I have, I do have it confirmed in writing that okay. that those costs were going to be absorbed by the project. And by, that's by off the to Marty Tilton because when this happened, he was he down was, there the next yeah. morning on a Saturday morning, 
and he was down there cleaning himself Him and a pretty couple much. Of his guys and, yep, were there and, down there cleaning the track off and and trying to get the fields ready for use uh, the following day. Did we get any um, feedback in terms of the issues with the uh, team building? I know there was some. Oh yeah, what happened? With so the yep, they did come back. They did. They believed that they it was a, a grading issue on the site, but they were also going to be looking at the um, whatever you know wherever it penetrated right. to resolve that. Looked like they ceiling. Yeah. yeah. Some sort of a, yeah. Looked like they did some digging there. They I did. They get pulled them. back the yeah, whatever that, run, whatever yeah, you call it. it. Not, not really retaining, but yeah. we haven't had a further problem. Because I think other than the football team practicing now, we're pretty much, we're done with the field until the spring because. Uh, might be for school use. Might be something yeah. Said. yeah, pretty much. But there's yeah. no more. Game we did ask them to come back um, to do some work with the drain that, that, is around the field oh, right. up, um, yeah. and so they have agreed to do that to come back with with no cost to us well I'm um, really glad that worth that got did. authorized Friday it did yes it Friday I'm really yeah. glad to hear we, yeah. we've got um, sign off and then paying for the yes yeah, that's excellent yeah. thank you so I'd say that's pretty much it Mel for the uh, athletic subcommittee report and the athletic facility and yeah. the athletic facility and, and if I could I'm sorry I don't mean to interrupt but just to that point it's not just the field it was the power washing right. that got all of that cost is being Right. Passed on. Okay. Yep. Secondary School Building Committee met on October 25th. Again, we talked about the usual issues. I think, I think John summarized it pretty it. well. <laughs> yep. um, okay, subcommittee meeting schedule is the SSBC is meeting on uh, November 9th at 10.30 a.m. Finance planning team at uh, on November 15th at 8.15 uh, in the superintendent's conference room. The SSBC meeting is uh, on the 15th also at 5.30 here. Uh, NORCAM board of directors at the NORCAM office on November 17th at 7. And the athletic subcommittee meets November 29th at 12.30 in the afternoon in the superintendent's conference room. Administrative report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So a few things for you. Um, I have, have a packet for you. Um, I'm pleased to inform you and the community that the little school um, roof replacement project is substantially complete. As a matter of fact, I signed the certificate of substantial complete, completion this morning. Um, project has gone, has, has gone very well, um, extremely smooth. We're pleased. Um, there are a few minor things to be tended to, but um, nothing of great significance. I will tell you, too, that you might recall going back, the project bids did come in um, under the budgeted amount by, you know, I'm going to give you some rough num numbers, roughly $120,000, but we believe that there is a place to um, recoup additional funds um, from even that number. So to say that the project was, you know, on time under budget is true, um, but we believe it's going to be even uh, more under budget, which is a good sign. Can we keep that money? Uh, yeah. well, that means it's less we have to borrow, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. I think it's probably going to be in the area of about an additional twenty to twenty-five thousand so dollars. That's like enough that. to really get a, put a good start on the uh, restroom facility. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, those aren't exact figures, but I think that's a very good. I think uh, I'll call the finance committee. Right now, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking the field project, but that's okay. Oh, it just okay. almost fit. It was almost yeah. an exact yeah. match, yeah. but. Uh, yeah. So very good project. I, I, I've gotten some calls now. I think you might recall that. Um, the Hacks architectural firm, we were their first MS, this project was their first project in Massachusetts with the MSBA. So I think we got, you know, I would, I, I certainly don't mean to suggest that they wouldn't give the same level of attention to any project, but we, I think we got very good attention from them. And um, I've gotten already two calls. Michael, I think you've gotten some A calls, calls too, right? as well. People, yeah. recommendations on them. And I, project management, company Compass, well. Compass project management was very good. Mm -hmm. so, so a good project. I did provide you in your packet a list of um, special project stipend requests that I'm looking to award to um, administrators, some of the administrators in the district for work above um, the normal scope of their work. So there's a little bit of a list here. Um, it's about, you know, this is just for the, this is for fiscal year 17. It was part of your packet. It was, not, it was not part of the packet tonight. It was part of your packet from the weekend, yes. So it should be the last thing. So essentially, um, um, if you'd like me to just go through this, Mr. Chairman, quickly, would you like me to just read through? This is, this is um, we're extending the work of the school safety and security protocols into one more year. Um, we have also found a need to overhaul 
our, the EOP stands for Emergency Oper Operation Planning Schedule. With the advent of the new middle high school as a campus combined, we needed to do an awful lot of work around uh, up re updating our um, evacuation protocols, um, systems, so to speak, organizational systems with um, the new schools. The, 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 the information we had for the old middle school and the old high school was, not, was no longer current. Uh, Mr. Maloney at the middle school um, will continue to serve as the after school activity coordinator, although that money um, gets paid for $1,000 gets paid from the money uh, raised for the um, coordination of the activities by the fee charged. For Dr. Daly, I'm looking for him to um, oversee the school start times advisory committee. Um, for Mr. Connolly, the athletic facilities committee, the work that's um, He's done with the, the bid process and such for both that project and the little school playground. Mr. McKay, the principal of the Hood School, um, excuse me, that was $1,500. The school um, community garden project at the, at the Hood School for Mr. McKay, $750. Mrs. Conant, the PPS director, um, I've asked her to continue to serve as the school district's uh, 504 coordinator. This is an, a, kind of an annual responsibility of $1,500. And I hadn't intended for any special project awards for the secondary school building project, although the pro for this year, um, but the project has continued, and I, I feel as though the work that I'm asking uh, Ms. O'Connell and Mr. Lepret to continue to do as the middle school and high school principals warrants um, a $1,500 stipend. So it's not as much as has been asked in the past. I think last, you know, sometimes we're in the area of $13,000 to $16,000. This year the total is $11,250. So I, I think in the past there hasn't been a vote of the committee, but it's been more of just a consensus to allow me to go forward with those awards. So just a, a question or more of a comment. I understand that these are part of the contracts and we've awarded them in the past. I, I, I'd like to seriously recommend that we revisit. Table. Well, I, I was going to ask the table this, but I was also going to say that we revisit the contracts. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm starting to. Well, the contracts are just enabling. Right. It doesn't mean we have to do it. I'm saying so, we could also take that out of the Well, we, we could, but I think the fact that the language is in the contract, I think there are times when extraordinary events take place, like the school building project, that you maybe want to leave in the contract, but right. the actual, you know, the actual uh, allocation of the funds is separate from from the contract. But I was going to ask the table this to, to give, because I have to admit, I didn't spend much time looking at this at all. Is this normally the time of year that we, we do this? It is. Last year was November was. 16th. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question if you can answer it for me. And I hope she doesn't take it the wrong way. But um, you had mentioned the 504 coordinator. You had asked her to do it again. It's kind of like part of her job. I don't think it really is because 504 isn't really a special ed initiative. But it sometimes kind of straddles the line. And the district does need to have a district coordinator. What is 504? It's related to... Uh, it's non-special ed. It's accommodations providing access yeah. to the full curriculum for any student with a... It could be a medical accommodation, as an example. Yeah. Right. There are students who have 504 plans, right? That's Correct. Right. A, a sizable number. I thought when you had presented it that you said that you'd asked her to do it as kind of like part of her job. So that's... Oh, no. I'm sorry. No. No. Okay. As kind of an additional responsibility. Okay. All right. Sorry. My misinterpretation. No, that's fine. So you'd like to think about it and talk at the next I, meeting? Or? I, I kind of agree with Mr. Webster on this, that we may want to table it and take another look at it. OK. And again, no, I'm not saying that any of this is undeserved. Or I, I just haven't, I haven't spent the time sure. looking at it. So okay. uh, I don't know if the other members feel the same. Well, I know last year we got some sort of write-up. I, I have those. I haven't given them to you in the past. I've kind of had them available for okay. you to look at them, but I, I do have those here. So maybe um, some more information yeah. would sure. be helpful. Sure. Why don't I scan that? I can scan those and email them out, out to you all. Okay. okay. I can do that in the morning. Sounds, Sounds like good. a good move. Okay. Um, just a couple of other things. I also, um, and, and, and actually I want to talk about one thing that I did not put in my report. Um, I, I just included for you a copy of my fall newsletter. I try to do this every season. I think I've been upholding that. I think uh, I've been trying to do four a year. Yeah, Mr. Um, Minot, I want to compliment you on that. I actually find myself reading it. 
and it's really you warm my heart. No, Jerry. no, I'm serious. <laughs> and it's 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 the it's, one thing he reads all year. Yeah, it's <laughs> no, it's really a remarkable amount of time and coordination and everything that goes. Well, it, it's really good. Thank you, I appreciate really that. I, I do. I have kind of expanded a little bit with giving um, the assistant superintendent, the director of yeah. finance. I've, I've asked them, you know, which. Just if there's something they want to write about, um, you know, but uh, Dan Downs has been doing some things, a lot of good technology. You talk about getting information out. I mean, that, that alone. I have to tell you, I did, I did get a few emails over the weekend from parents that just, you know, they love it. Oh. You know, they, they do write nice things back to me. They, they commit to me that they'll take the time to read it, so well, I'm glad. I'm glad that just, this does. You know, along those lines, I compliment you and our staff, and, you know, this started back under, we really started uh, writing this up under, under Kathy, um, yeah. the previous superintendent, but... We really do a good job informing the community. There's an article in the transcript every single week. Kathy started that, but I think John even went right, another, John took another step that. And, with that. And we still have the, the um, NRPS, inside NRPS on uh, Oh, you, so my last show was Wayne. Wayne. I had, I have you seen it? Yes. It, was, it was great. I yeah, we had Wayne. Wayne, I had Wayne Hardiker on. It was and good. And had Cynthia on in an earlier episode. They're thinking of making that into a reality show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The unreality show. follow Wayne around. The Kardashians and then yeah. inside. It was really, you know. It's going to be inside Wayne Hardiker and yeah. then follow him it's been, it's been fun. We, we've, uh, yeah, we, we, you know, you know Wayne. It was, it was very interesting. He was nervous. In fact, you saw us the day we came back from the tape. Yeah. Wayne had a jack and tie. Jack yeah, he did. Exactly. I said, wait, what the hell's going on? Did you go to a funeral? <laughs> he goes, oh. Exactly. Wayne had a jacket. And it is. It, it's <laughs> fun. It is John fun to do. Him. It was great. And, it's uh, fun. It is it good. Was, but this is chock full of information. But we, we really, I think we do, um, between the articles, between the newsletters, what's on the website, um, and Julie and I continue our, um, our um, hapless and hopeless effort of informing on Facebook and <laughs> trying to keep the, uh, you know, the questions, hey, that's the, your the roar to a minimum. <laughs> and I think we do that. And I, can I tell like you, John's book selections too. I'm even thinking oh, I'll tell you, one, those, of, uh, yeah. one of these times, but yeah. they're, they're good. That, well, whatever, that you know, whatever good. you say about the social media, I can tell you that there, and Julie will back me up on this, there are a lot of people who appreciate us being on there. Yeah. They really are. And they yeah. say it well, all it's good. Time. Keep up the good work. Yeah. <laughs> I told them we're going to be introducing you soon as the new moderator. So a couple of, of other things. I, I just um, I'm going to I'm going to start to include um, periodically, maybe like once a quarter or so, just a um, kind of the executive director's report from both the North Shore Education Consortium and the SEAM Collaborative. You know, you appoint me to represent the district on those boards. I think it's a good idea for you to just kind of see. Um, I, while I go to meetings once a month, I don't want to overload you with paper and just and more information than you might need. But I just do. I do think they do a nice job as directors of both of those special education collaboratives. So I'm going to, if you see in your packet, I'll start to do this. I think maybe every um, three months or so, just to kind of give you some insight into the work that's going on. I and mean, we do have students at both schools, and I think it's, you know, I think it's a respectful kind of acknowledgement of, of of that the efforts going on at both both collaboratives. They're both very very good. The, the last thing I'll, I'll mention to you, it, I did not put it in my superintendent's report, but um, last Thursday, um, Dr. Downs, Dr. Daly, and I were treated to a tour of the Amazon Robotics Facility in North Reading. And we went for about an hour. It just so happens that a former student of mine from what, back when I was a teacher, um, his wife, um, they live in North Reading now. They have children in our school, three children in our schools, one at the middle school whom I see you know, very regularly. And his wife works in the PR department at Amazon Robotics. And long story short, you know, we had been talking about um, potential expansion of robotics programs from the middle school into the high school. One of our teachers, the, the curriculum specialist for science, um, Carrie Verdonk, happens to be friends with this young lady. Rebecca Mikulski is her name. We had a very good and interesting tour. I, you know, just very quickly, I'll let you know that all of the robots that are manufactured for Amazon warehouses are manufactured in North. It's the only place in the world where they're done. We saw we saw quite a quite a show, Patrick. But we saw quite a show for about an hour. And the good news is, I think there was some very um, positive vibes both ways. They're looking to do more in schools. We certainly are looking for them, um, you know, to help maybe help us. Um, I'll say both financially, potentially financially, and through volunteer work with students. Um, I think it would probably be at the middle school and the high school only, at least for right now. But um, it was a very good meeting. I think those kinds of opportunities sometimes get missed for us to kind of engage with the business community. I don't think it's for anyone's fault. Um, 
but it's it's hard it's hard you know they're they're looking to do something we're looking to do something so this could be a very profitable and I don't mean just in money but in in terms of working with our kids um, around a field that I think is just burgeoning they they have they have 50 engine there's 650 employees at that facility and they have 50 engineering jobs right now that they cannot fill um, it's a, it was amazing. We, what we saw was truly, Those robots are it was mind blowing. I really was so, I was so impressed. And as someone who doesn't, you know, Dan and Patrick are both, you know, far more versed in the technology world than I am. Um, although Patrick often compliments me and says, I'm, I'm at least eager to learn new things. And I, 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 he does, you know, and I appreciate that. I often put you and Jerry on the same scale. Oh, that, no, <laughs> please. No, Jerry's yeah. far ahead of you. Jerry. No, yeah. <laughs> It was it was really good. And, 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 Thank God I'm getting out to you. We're looking at bringing <laughs> students over there to see the facility. We have some parents of student our students, people they who like, live in North Reading. It was fascinating. No, you they do like you to do be a part of North Reading's um, uh, the what no, the, what? the uh, association the um, ed, you know education. Oh, the Ed Foundation. Yeah, foundation. Yeah, yeah. You actually. You uh, you do an excellent job with technology. I was just Jerry's a first class. I I do I do I'm at a little you know I remind Dan and Patrick that I'm a little bit older than they are too. So it's a, it is in some ways a generational thing. I just you know they've grown up with it far more than I have and and but I do find it fascinating and I think about our students and and you know I could there were there were definitely students that I could see that I know that if they walked into that facility they would just be you know, we happened to be there there was an MIT student group getting a tour. Um, it was it was fat. It just gets a very very small window into the wind operations of the Amazon Corporation. Well, it's, but it's unbelievable. They just they, they put those robots in the warehouse. They program them with all the items that they're supposed to get, and they go and get the items and on the shelves. There is a human and, element still right, to it, but it's element, but the the robots know when to charge themselves, exactly. and they go to a charging station and charge themselves. Yeah, plug in. It was it was fascinating. It was a whole much more to. Do you mind before we leave tonight? Changing my clock and my <laughs> <laughs> because I'm an, hour, I'm an hour early. I'll be your robot. <laughs> <laughs> so so this is I'll, the hour. <laughs> Jerry, huh? You just hold. No, no, I can't find time. it. I can't find it. <laughs> I'll brief you more should something come to pass. But I'm, I was very encouraged that there could be a good partnership being formed here. You know, uh, relatively it, soon. That sounds like something. They are, you remember our hour of code last year? Yeah. Yeah. Dan Downs is cool. they're going to participate with hour of code this year. I think it's December. Ninth, I'm not sure exactly, but I think it's early December. So, Dan, and Dan, I gotta say, he's been incredibly oh, he's active been, with he and his digital learning department. They the doing a very nice job. Yeah, he's that, really good. doing a very nice job. That I sounds agree. like a natural resource. We should mine it. Yes, right here in North Reading. Right here in North Reading. I had no idea. Really, it was it was very very interesting. So, okay. So thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. All right, future business, we have a regular meeting here at the Distance Learning Lab, November 21st at 6.30, December 12th at 6.30, and January 9th at 6.30. January 2017. Are we doing our and Christmas party? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, That'll have to be Motion to adjourn. Huh? Motion, I move to adjourn. Second. Second. Yeah, that's I mean, all in favor. Aye. 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 <laughs> yeah, Christmas.